Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. And now... Story time. One of the most terrifying experiences I had as a backcountry park ranger was dealing with what people refer to as shadow people. It was in the spring of 97, and I was working for the federal government. My duties consisted of being the only law enforcement officer in a small national park near Lake Tahoe. The majority of my time there was spent in solitude, patrolling by vehicle, boat, or on foot, looking for campers who overstayed their welcome, finding lost fishermen, or people who got turned around hiking in the woods. Shadow men are often reported to be seen at night when encountering them. They are described as tall figures that stand very still, usually in doorways or passageways when encountered by the witness. The first encounter I had with one was actually when I was walking along a trail far from any campsite or place any human could be. It was probably close to 3 in the morning. My location was along the edge of a heavily forested part of our park, bordering onto private property owned by a hunting club. It's very rugged, mountainous terrain covered with lots of pine trees and oak with extremely steep inclines leading up to high elevation mountain peaks that tower above the tree line. This particular area of the park is a notorious hotspot for Bigfoot activity, and although I never saw one there, I've spoken with other staff members who have. I can remember walking along that trail in the night with my light shining all around me as I walked, looking down at the ground where my feet were stepping. The light reflecting off the dirt making it easier to see where I was going, because seeing out there is pretty tough. There was no moonlight this night, and you couldn't really tell with anything the way it was shining, but occasionally, it seemed as if a beam of bright starlight would peek through a hole in the canopy right above, just making a brief enough appearance before disappearing behind some clouds drifting overhead. My mind began to wander, thinking about work and family, and all of a sudden, I think my sixth sense started working overtime. I jumped out of my skin. It felt as if somebody had grabbed me by the hair with their hand. Then this jolt of electricity ran through my entire body, as if I had gotten shocked. I felt extremely nauseated like I had to vomit. I decided to turn back. I could tell there was just something very wrong. I think there are some kind of demonic entities that feed off human fear that rotate around these woods. That's why they only come out at night. I am 29 now. This incident happened when I was 7 years old. I don't have many details of the sighting other than my aunts and uncles who were originally from MS lived in the town of Coos Bay, Oregon. I have no idea how far we drove to camp that year. It was the only time I had ever been to Oregon, and probably the only time I will ever go. Nearest town, Reedsport and Florence, Oregon. Nearest road, observed. In July of 1978, when I was just seven years old, I traveled to Oregon with my family to visit relatives. We spent three weeks in the state, and I was lucky enough to see what I think was Bigfoot. We had camped in an area that was dense and close to a shallow river. It was almost like the camp was a bald spot with a wall of brush and trees around it. There was a trail that led to the shallow river, and although it probably wasn't far, it seemed so to me. The late afternoon was sunny and warm, and everyone but my cousin, my uncle and myself went to look for herds of elk or antelope. We had campers to sleep in, and my uncle and my cousin were both napping when this sighting occurred. I was outside one of the campers playing when I heard a rustling of underbrush. I never smelled anything that I can remember, or heard a sound other than the rustling. When I looked up, I noticed that a small sapling, maybe the size of the end of a baseball bat, just bent completely over. This sapling was behind a thick wall of what appeared to be some sort of a berry bush. I am not sure what kind though. I was curious and walked over to where I had seen the sapling bend over, thinking that there was a squirrel hanging onto it or something. That is when a large hand reached out from behind this brush and grabbed a handful of berries. I had to be 8 or 10 feet away at the time. The hand was huge with long reddish brown hair. It was clear that it was a hand and not a paw. 
I stood there in total shock. When I managed to run, I ran for my life. It did not chase me or anything, but I saw all that I wanted to see of it. The hand was scary enough. I probably would have died of fright had I seen the rest of it. I got back into camp, which was not far away, but far enough for my napping cousin and uncle not to hear anything. I never screamed or made a sound, I just ran and sat as close to that camper as I could. I realized when I sat down in the fine dirt that I had wet my shorts. I was seven years old and I had never done that before. I kept my mouth shut until my mother and my other uncles and aunts that were from Oregon got back from antelope or elk sightseeing. I told them everything, and they told me that it had to have been a bear. I described the color of the hair, and I was told that it must have been black hair that I had seen, because this area only had black bears. I wasn't stupid. I knew the difference between a hand and a paw, and the difference between reddish brown and black. I managed to let them convince me that it must have been a bear, and we left and came back to our home state of Mississippi. A few years later, I was in sixth grade. We had a library period, and we could look for and check out books. I found a book with a black cover, and if I am not mistaken, the title was, Bigfoot. I hurried to check this book out, and read it from cover to cover. It wasn't until that moment that I figured out that the animal that I had seen those years earlier had a name. I had never been so excited in my life. Ever since, I have been interested in all sightings, shows, books, etc. Of the Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yeti, Skunkape. I have thought about telling my story for years, but I, like everyone else, have been afraid of the teasing and skepticism of others. My family says, we believe that you believe what you saw. I will believe it until the day I die. I am 29 now, and I hope that the mystery will be solved in my lifetime. My husband and my son believe me more than my mom, dad, aunts, uncles and cousins. I am very genuine and honest, and I would never lie about. Something like that. I don't know why I was one of the chosen people to have had the opportunity to see even just a tiny part of this mysterious creature. I figured I'd just ask God when I get to heaven. During my years as a park ranger, I encountered things that would terrify the most tenacious trekker. However, nothing on God's earth has ever given me as much cause for existential dread, as the undertunnels of the Grand Canyon. Those treacherous tunnels were not carved by human hands, and they certainly were not intended for human eyes. I have heard so many tales of uncovered underground passages in the Grand Canyon. It's not a new concept. But there's a difference between a hidden passage and the undertunnels. I probably should have left this place long ago, but I think I'm too afraid. Like Pandora's box, once certain things have been learned, they cannot be unlearned. I feel I have an obligation to stay here until my dying day. Besides, no matter how far I might be able to run, it would never be far enough. There might be undertunnels beneath all places. I don't actually work as a ranger anymore, but I like to say that I still perform a service to the park, because I frequent the bars and other hospitality attractions of the area. I keep an eye and an ear on things. I still hear awful tales. That's how I know I'm not alone. I know there are others who have seen what I saw several years ago. Look, I'm not trying to deter you from coming here. I'm simply saying that you shouldn't ever seek the horrors that hide in the hovels of the Grand Canyon. That only applies to those of you who explore the gorge itself. If you simply want to admire vibrant vistas atop the edges of the canyon, then go for it. Book a tour. It's well worth the experience. But I would strongly advise against exploring what lies in its depths. Most people never stumble upon an entrance to the under tunnels, but why would you take the chance? I hope you will respect my privacy. And that's why I'm going to refer to myself by the nickname that my youngest daughter, Eliza, bestowed upon me. Mr. Danger, the park ranger. And he goes on adventures with his sidekick, his sunshine, the porcupine. Eliza loves her porcupine costume. I have always marveled at my daughter's boundless creativity. My wife, Riley, on the other hand, prefers for us to stick to jollier topics. Why do you fill her head with the idea that you once had such a terrifying job? Riley asked. 
because life as a financial advisor is so dull in comparison, I replied. Boo, boring, Eliza groaned, making a farting noise. Exactly what I want to say to my boss every day, I said. Before any of you start panicking that I've been traumatizing my 10-year-old daughter with detailed accounts of horrifying things that happened to me, I only tell ghost stories. Never anything real. Stories of trolls in the rocks and alien visitors. Perhaps it helps me deal with my trauma to create fictional horror stories. Can I tell a spooky story next? Eliza asked. I grinned and said, go for it, the sunshine. It's the story of a witch who wants, Eliza began. No witches, I firmly stated. And after that conversation, earlier this evening, I was forced to relive the most haunting night of my entire life. The night I spent in the belly of the Grand Canyon, tirelessly hunting for two teenage girls who had gone missing. I hoped and prayed for an easy search and rescue job. I feared that I would find two injured spelunkers in some hard-to-reach crevice. That was my worst-case scenario. I had no concept of the real worst-case scenario. Traversing the rocky terrain of the colossal chasm that spans Grand Canyon National Park, I found myself looking up at the wondrous walls that rose like earthly skyscrapers above me. At first, I felt soothed and comforted by their presence. However, as the sun began to set and my torch became my new guide, those canyon wall shapes shifted into something far more insidious. They no longer felt like warm blankets. They felt like the walls of my coffin. My harrowing thoughts were interrupted by the fluttering wings of a crow that circled above me. I ignored the creature, pressing onwards, but I could feel its black eyes boring into the crown of my head. It was watching me as I walked. When I was a park ranger, I liked to think of myself as a man who had a strong affinity with all animals, but that cawing crow evoked a frightful feeling in my heart. Even as a whippersnapper on the job, and one who, at that point in my life, hadn't personally experienced anything terrible, my animal instinct was well honed. Come on, Mr. Danger, I told myself. You're not about to be bested by a crow, are you? What would Emma Sunshine say if she could see you now? I clutched my torch tightly in my right hand, and started waving it around in a manic, frantic motion, attempting to shoo the bird away. At that moment, I was startled by the sudden sound of footsteps from the darkness ahead of me. With lightning-fast reflexes, I shone the torchlight in the direction of the sound. Somebody emerged from the side of a rock, and their flashlight came into view. Steady, it's me, Jack cried. I thought you might want some help with the search. Any luck? I've found something quite promising. Jack, as I've named him for the purpose of this story, was a fellow park ranger. He was a wizened old fellow, and I always viewed him as a second father figure. He was a little odd, and his jokes often elicited eye rolls, but I'd never been so relieved to see his goofy grin. Hands still trembling, my light erratically danced and darted across the rocks between us. No sign of them. You scared the absolute shit out of me, Jack, I sighed. It's a good job I wore my brown trousers. Jack laughed and beckoned for me to follow him. So, what's your promising find, I asked. Well, let's just say we should be home and putting our feet up in no time at all. I think I found the cave system that the two girls must have explored, he explained, leading the way. It's not one that I recognize, truth be told, but I suppose I might be getting forgetful in my old age. Anyway, I'm almost certain they entered it. There was a campfire by the entrance. Recently burned out. Must be them. F. I groaned. Last thing I want to do at 9 o'clock on a Saturday evening, is fish some dumb, unprepared, injured kids out of a cave. Better than fishing some dumb, unprepared, dead kids out of a cave, eh? Jack pointed out. Let's hope your version of events ends up being the true one. I solemnly nodded my head, thinking of the countless lives that had been lost in that canyon. Whenever I had cause to moan or groan, I reminded myself of why I'd taken that job. I reminded myself of the people I was trying to protect. It was on nights like those that a ranger had to prove their worth. I prayed that we would find two live hikers. Huh, Jack said. What? I asked. As we rounded a tall stack of rocks, 
My friend scratched his chin thoughtfully, casting his light onto a smoldering pile of sticks. I was looking at the burnt out campfire, as promised, but there was no sign of the mysterious cave entrance. Just a solid canyon wall, as there had always been in that spot, as far as I could recall. I was certain that Jack, who was 30 years my senior, had started to lose his marbles. But none of the park rangers had the heart to tell him to hang up the hat. It was what he loved. The park was the thing that kept him alive. I know you're gonna laugh, Jack sighed. But I'm telling you that there was a cave entrance right in that very spot, kiddo. I mean, I was right about the campfire, wasn't I? I wasn't gonna accuse you of lying, Jack, I replied. It's dark, and neither of us can see shit out here. Even with these flashlights, the human mind is a fickle thing. It loves to play tricks. You know that. But let's not despair. We must be on the right track. You're right about that. The campfire is a good sign. Yeah, I suppose you're oh. Jack stopped, looking to the side of my head. What? I asked. He chuckled. Got a little something on your shoulder, partner. I swiveled my head to the left and screamed. There, staring back at me with hollow eyes, was the black crow that had been stalking me. It was silently perching on my shoulder. I hadn't even felt it there. It hadn't so much as made a sound or moved into my field of vision. It was a gaunt, ghastly statue, posing with such stillness that it might as well have been a taxidermy bird. Jack cackled until he wheezed and spluttered. He continued to be of no use whatsoever, whilst I flailed around in a mad panic, striving to release the creature from my shoulder. Eventually, thankfully, it flew away. To my park ranger friend, it was an amusing incident. To me, it was something much worse. I didn't like the entire situation. The disappearing cave entrance. The eerily serene bird. None of it. Not one bit. As I said, I have good instincts. And I don't fear animals, for the record. I never have. I care deeply even for nature's most ominous and overlooked creatures. Crows had never bothered me before that fateful night. But that crow was like none I'd ever seen before. I didn't know what was wrong with it, but I knew that the mere sight of it filled me with immense horror. It was dangerous, and I'm not talking about the fun and mischief that Mr. Danger and Emma's Sunshine love. This was real danger, danger that I'd forgotten all about until Eliza reminded me of something that had been hiding in the darkened recesses of my fractured, forlorn mind. Wait. Jack said. It moved. Suddenly, my park ranger friend was sprinting past me, so I turned to see what had stirred him. And then I saw it. On the canyon wall opposite to the one we had been facing, there was a cave entrance. It was one I was certain I'd never seen in that area before, and that made me truly start to question everything. Maybe Jack hadn't lost his marbles. That could only mean something more unsettling was happening. Either we were both incompetent park rangers or something unnatural had happened. Jack, I started. Let's just talk about this for a moment. Jack had already reached the mouth of the cave, and he was jubilantly dancing in the entrance. Before I even had a chance to talk about the horrible feeling in the center of my chest, I spotted something that snapped me out of my feverish stupor. Jack, I warned. Wolf. Jack immediately stopped dancing in the entrance and cast his torchlight onto a large, gray wolf that was slinking towards him. It did not growl. It did not make a sound, in fact. It simply took long, purposeful strides towards my frozen friend. Easy, buddy, Jack calmly said. I don't have any treats for you, and I'm not as tasty as I look. I promise. Now, ordinarily, I'd scare you off with the rubber bullets, but I'm a little unprepared this evening, I have to admit. So, I'm warning you not to get too close. Otherwise, you'll get the butt of the torch. Jack, I said, speaking with the same air of calmness. Keep your cool. I've been doing this a lot longer than you, kid. Don't worry about F. The wolf moved abnormally quickly, pouncing towards Jack, who slammed his torch into the animal's face. The creature, along with Jack's torch, went flying to the ground. It did not whimper or even falter for more than a second. It was calm. Too calm. 
The wolf simply clambered back to its feet, and eyeballed a now torchless Jack. I shone my own light onto the cave entrance, illuminating my defenseless friend, and the wolf that had started to prowl towards him once more. Jack, just let me, I started. I have to head into the cave, Jack cried. In a flash, my reckless ranger companion had sprinted into the cave. The darkness swallowed him, and the wolf that was hot on his tail. I ran after the pair of them, lighting the way with my shaky torch. Entering the passage through the canyon wall, I tried to focus all of my attention on Jack and the wolf, who were already out of sight in the labyrinth of tunnels, but I couldn't help fixating on the peculiar noises that engulfed me. Rocks were shifting, as if the canyon were continuously reshuffling and restructuring itself. Jack, I screeched. I tumbled through a hole and cut my elbows on a rocky slope that led down to a sprawling, cavernous opening. I scrambled to my feet and quickly picked up my torch, fearing what I might see in the center of the underground space. In the center of the cave, I expected to see the wolf tearing my friend limb from limb. What I actually saw was far worse because it couldn't be explained. Jack was there, but he was not facing a wolf. He was facing something indescribably horrible. A gangly creature towered over him, skin like a decaying corpse and limbs twice as long as those of any ordinary human. It was a monstrously magnified version of a person. No, not a person. A witch. A skin walker, as Native Americans would no doubt call it. The stuff of legends. A monster that I had only ever seen in frightening fables. Not something real. And yet, my eyes were telling me a different truth. I could see the thing with my own eyes. The thing that goes by so many different names in so many different places. Still, no matter what name it is given, everybody agrees that it is an unholy thing. An abomination not meant for our world. Death incarnate. Jack, I near soundlessly gasped. My friend began to levitate, his writhing body's ascension orchestrated by the gnarled, brittle fingers of the inhuman thing before it. The witch, a silent and serene puppeteer continued to raise her hand. Utilizing some unseen evil force, she moved my wriggling friend higher and higher into the air, watching his illuminated form in my torchlight. The creature was as still and unwavering as the crow and the wolf, and that was when I pieced the parts of the puzzle together. I remembered the feeling of being stalked by the crow. Those beastly black eyes. A sudden snapping sound broke me out of my disturbing daydream, instead thrusting me into a much more deeply disturbing taste of reality. Jack released a scream that ricocheted off the walls of the enclosed space, as his legs bent the wrong way. The bones broke, one by one, and protruded from the back of his knees, as his calves were pulled up to his waist. His jaw started to droop, and I realized that he was moments away from losing consciousness. As morbid as it sounds, I prayed that he would faint. I prayed that he would not be conscious during his own painful demise. As the witch began to snap his arms inwards, and contort his body into a box shape, my friend's head finally lolled forwards. Looking at his mangled, compressed form, I realized that he wasn't unconscious. He was dead. At that moment, the rocks on one of the walls crumbled away, revealing a stack of boxes, and surprisingly, a red wooden door. As the witch opened one of the boxes and began to crumple my friend's mangled, desecrated carcass into it, I crept around the back of her. She busied herself with the act of packing her latest victim into a wooden, gold-lined treasure box, and she did not seem to notice the torch light that was moving around her, as I inches closer and closer to the red door on the far wall. Stealthily, I made it across the cave and placed my hand on the door handle. The creature screeched. In a blind panic, I swung the door open, and closed it behind me. To my utter surprise, I was facing a long, unlit tunnel. A tunnel constructed of red bricks on the walls, floor, and ceiling. The real under tunnels. This was more than just a cave system. It was, I realized, the witch's lair. There was no way I could survive by going backwards, so I had to push forwards. Lighting the way with my torch, I ran blindly through the unlit red brick tunnel, not knowing what I might find around every bend. Suddenly, there were multiple forking passageways. I had no idea which way to go. 
I just knew that I'd heard the red door open behind me, and heard the slow, steady, still serene padding footsteps of the thing that had brutally massacred Jack. Help! The voice cried from a tunnel to my left, so I immediately followed the sound. Cowering in the dead end fork of the tunnel was a girl. She must have been 18 or 19, fully kitted out in hiking gear, and coated from head to toe in blood. It didn't look like hers. Oh, thank God, she whimpered. We have to get out of here, that thing is coming for us. Where's your friend, I asked. The girl's lip trembled. Alicia, she's, she's gone. Alicia, so, you're Daniela, right, I asked. She nodded. I'm sorry about your friend Daniela. I lost someone too. But we're going to make it out of here, I promised. I think we should go back to the red door, Daniela said. We know the way back from there. I shook my head, helping Daniela to her feet, and pointed a finger to my ear, indicating for her to listen. I was trying to show the girl that it wasn't safe to go back the way we came. But I couldn't hear the witch's padding footsteps. I suddenly realized that not hearing her was far worse. Where was she? What? Daniela asked. I don't hear her. That doesn't mean she's not there. Come on, I said. I led a begrudging Daniela farther into the depths of the tunnels, shaking as we rounded every corner. Every time I saw the coast was clear, it was both a relief and a fright. Not knowing where she might be hiding was a horror like no other. And then, from the depths of the brick tunnels, we heard a sound. Crying. It's a trick, Daniela protested. Don't go towards it. It sounds like a girl, I said. Maybe Alicia's still alive. I followed the sound of the crying, thankful for the fact that the tunnel no longer seemed to be forming off into different directions. I was relatively certain that it was more of an interconnected circuit of tunnels, rather than a maze. All routes would have led me to the same place, eventually. A wooden, colorless door, and there was crying on the other side. Daniela sobbed and said, don't go in there. I ignored her, motivated by a sense of duty, and perhaps, a smidge of stupidity. I burst through the door and found myself in a cavern much larger than the last one. And thankfully, there was a cave entrance at the far side. I could see the outside world. It was a horribly dark night, but it looked like a glowing beacon of hope. Anything was lighter than the hellish under tunnels of the witch. Casting the light around the cave, I eventually found Alicia, pinned down by rocks on her arms. Tauntingly close to freedom. She was staring blankly ahead and bawling her eyes out. When she saw my flashlight, she screamed. Help, Alicia wailed. I'm trapped. It definitely felt like a trap, but I wouldn't have been able to live with myself if I hadn't tried. Moreover, yet again, my instinct was telling me that I was looking at Alicia. It wasn't the witch. I could just feel it in my bones. I darted over to the girl and heaved the rocks from her arms. There were cuts and bruises along her limp limbs, so I hoisted Alicia to her feet. She screeched when she saw Daniela. Get her away from me, Alicia cried. Alicia, Daniela replied. It's me. Alicia shook her head and gently nodded at the far wall of the cave. I turned my head to see what the girl had been eyeballing when I first entered the cavernous room. I was horrified to see a girl's body on the ground. Lifeless and twisted into an unimaginable shape. Not just any girl. Daniela. There were two of them. As I turned my torch light back to the Daniela who had just followed me from the under tunnels, she nonchalantly threw a smile our way. And yet, as calm as she may have been, it was the most unhinged and malicious smile I have ever seen. Alicia and I slowly backed towards the cave exit, watching as the fake Daniela started to grow in height. Her limbs started to elongate and her hair fell out. Within seconds, I was staring at the horrific creature that had crushed my friend alive. Run, I screamed. As we sprinted for the exit, it began to close. The rocks shifted around it, slowly shrinking the hole that was our only path to freedom. With seconds to spare, Alicia dived through the opening, and I followed. Turning to face the closing hole, I caught one final glimpse of the inhuman creature, before it was entombed in the wall of the Grand Canyon. 
I have never told anyone that tale, and I was a park ranger for many years after that. If anything, understanding that such things existed was my reason for continuing. There are other reasons that I eventually abandoned that line of service. But my duty has never really died. And when Eliza reminded me of witches, I realized it was time to finally tell my story. You may or may not choose to believe me. None of that matters. But please, I beg you, do not enter the under tunnels of the Grand Canyon. At around 14 years old, in 2009, I was sleeping in bed with my mum. My dad wasn't home, and she didn't want to sleep alone. I hated the dark so I pounced at the chance to have another human present while asleep. The house we lived in had a lot of paranormal activity that friends and family also saw, so it was a welcomed invitation. To give context to the location and experience, I want to explain the layout. The bedroom door led straight to a huge bed in the center. There was a bedside on either side of the bed. The bed was a king-size mattress that rested atop a tall bedboard. They didn't have a bed frame. Instead, the bedboard base was approximately the same height as a tall couch. You had to climb up onto it. The bedside was incredibly low next to the bed, and you had to half slide off the bed towards it to reach for a drink or phone. In my case, I had my hearing aid and phone at the bedside, and we said goodnight. Lights out. There was nothing to note about falling asleep, and no strange feelings. I was deep, deep asleep, and suddenly awoke with a huge jolt. I was so shocked and confused, and I leaned forward to check the time on my brick Nokia phone. Remember that I'm having to reach across the vast expanse of the bed, and slide down towards the low bedside cabinet. I tapped the middle button on the phone, and the bluish-white glow lit up in a little bubble, just above the phone, and next to the bedside. I saw a huge being crouching next to me. It was directly across from my body and face, while I had been sleeping. My arm passed its right shoulder to reach out and tap the phone on the bedside. I flung backward in horror, and the phone light started to dim. I could see it was a white or pallish complexion with almost textured skin that clung to their body tightly, and incredibly lean. The memory that has always haunted me was how unfathomably large it was. The arms were resting upon its knees as it crouched next to me, heaving with dark black eyes staring into my own. Its face did not move, and I could recognize in its eyes that it was registering that I was freaking out, but it did not move, blink or react. I don't know why my awareness did not bother it. It just continued to bore into my eyes as the light faded out from the room, and it turned back into the blanket of darkness. I was petrified and froze for a few moments, trying not to breathe. My mum hadn't woken by my movements, and I didn't want to make a sound in case it suddenly advanced on me. I couldn't grab my hearing aid and phone to acquire more senses to deal with the situation. I didn't want to reach out and try my luck again. I was trying to process how horrifying it looked. I lay there trying to figure out how to respond. I knew it was still right there. I couldn't believe how it was tall enough, while in a crouched position to be directly parallel to my face, lying on this highly stacked bed structure. I couldn't stand the fact that it was directly in line with my face, and I could still feel it watching. I didn't know what to do because its limbs were so long, and I felt like it could thrash toward me instantaneously. I couldn't figure out its intentions and why it had not advanced. Its torso was tight and slender as it had been raggedly breathing, but its appearance did not disguise the strength in its body. It looked like it was coiled to move at any moment. I slowly rolled over and prayed for sleep to come. I think I stared into the darkness behind my mother's back for a while, and then it all went blank as I somehow fell back to sleep. It's the one story out of all the encounters that I've had which still disturbs me. It's the one that is truly unexplainable and unknown. My wife recently showed me a picture of a crawler after listening to a podcast, and I was left with my mouth hanging agape. It was like being next to the bed. Crawler, you tell me. I had been watching television for some time when I glanced at the clock, and noticed the time August 22, 1993, 
at 3.35 am, then back to the TV. It was at that moment that I noticed odd lights in front of the hill opposite my house. There was an object about 100 yards away at an altitude of roughly 150 feet. The object moved slowly. It had huge lighted windows, 13 in all, along its side that appeared to be 8 feet wide and 6 feet high. Each had round corners, and they were approximately 6 feet apart. The altitude of the object was lower than any plane that I had ever seen. I made my way to the bedroom and retrieved a pair of binoculars. The object moved parallel to my position and towards the ocean. It was impossible to see the outline and therefore the shape of the object, a fact that bothers me to this day. The windows were, however, highly visible due to a bright light that appeared to be coming from inside, though the source of the light could not be seen. I opened the living room window and discovered that the object did not emit any sound. Through the binoculars, I could see people on the left side of the object sitting at tables that were in every window. There were also three or four people walking abreast, to and from the front and rear of the object, sometimes passing as groups without having to make room. There were tables on the other side as well with people sitting at them, mostly three to four people at a table. Everyone was dressed in the same, grey uniforms with high collars, which reminded me of something out of the medieval era. None of the people had any hair on their heads, and none wore hats or helmets of any sort. They all appeared to be very similar in size and slightly built. They were also very pale. Most of the people sitting seemed to be engaged in drinking from extra-large white, luminous cups. One group, however, was staring continuously down at the table, as if they were watching something that could not be seen by me. By now, I was sweating and shaking and having a hard time holding on to the binoculars. I was also having difficulty swallowing. The object then continued to move slowly out over the water. It then went towards Conception Bay, disappearing from view. In 1998, I was a senior in high school, taking a late night ride with my boyfriend near his house in Naperville, Lyle, Illinois. We were sneaking out to have a cigarette. As we were driving along a street, slowly with both windows completely down had a Mustang, and didn't want to wake the neighborhood with his loud exhaust we heard a loud screech in the distance. We looked at each other and confirmed that we both had heard the same thing. He slowed down to a complete stop to listen. All of a sudden, coming from the left side of the driver's side of the front windshield appeared this gargoyle-like thing. It was about four feet in length, with wings, front claws, reptilian-like skin, and big glowing eyes. The color is hard to remember, it was almost transparent, like purple. As it flew in front of the windshield, literally over the hood of the car, it stopped suddenly and proceeded to scare the crap out of us both. Its eye protruded from its head, and it made a snarling-like gesture. It definitely was trying to scare us. It then flew off or disappeared. This happened so quickly. The adrenaline in our veins is pumped instantly from the fright. Immediately after the thing flew off, I looked to the left at my boyfriend, and every hair on both of his arms was standing straight up. Again, we both confirmed what we had seen, and were bewildered. Twenty years later, I still wonder what we had seen. I've researched on my own on the net. I have found that what I had witnessed has been possibly been seen, and maybe still out there. This sighting makes me a believer that there is another dimension that we cannot see. It sometimes may show its face. This thing, this entity was not nice. It was demonic, it used its power over us to scare us beyond anything that I've ever felt before. I drive by the location all the time. I live near it. The location is near a wooded area, a subdivision, and, get this, an abbey and monastery. The land that we were traveling on, and also the wooded area perhaps it lived in was once land owned by the abbey. Is there a connection? I'd love to know. I'm from Western North Carolina in the Blue Ridge Mountains. I'm a deer hunter, and that's where I had my encounter with the big gun on the afternoon of December. Three deer had run out of the thicket through the bottom and up the ridge past me when. I say running I mean they were running for their lives. 
I could tell they weren't running from a rutting buck, but I got ready anyway. About 15 minutes later I hadn't seen anything else, and it was pretty dark by then. I then spotted something on the edge of the pond, and it was big. I looked through my scope, but I couldn't see anything. I lowered the gun, and I'd see movement again. I know I was looking at the right spot. It's pretty dark by now so I started packing everything up, and I was about 35 feet high in a popular tree and a climbing stand, so it took about 5 minutes to get to the ground. Once I got to the ground it was black in the woods. I started shaking my stand off the tree, and that's when I heard a scream, the loudest thing I've ever heard in my 32 years. This scream started out high, and ended up as a low growling sound. I would say it lasted maybe 4 to 6 seconds. I hit the ground and cut off my light. I could hear it walking on two legs in the creek bottom. It was super thick down there and man could not walk through it in the dark without a light. It sounded like it was coming up the ridge toward me, and I had to do something. I ripped around into a big oak tree close to me. When I did it took off and ran back through the creek bottom, and into the pines, like its butt was on fire. I got my stand and got the hell out. Two days later I took a friend back in there with me to look at the limbs it broke while running. It was on white oak limbs 3 inches thick, and was broken off 6 feet high off of the ground. The mountain laurel bushes were mowed down. It was a sight to see. I awoke one night in a state which I can only explain as a spasm, my body was rigid. I could not move a muscle and felt like something was on top of me. I fought to get movement back in my body. I could not turn my head or move at all. It was like I was having a fight to get control of my body. After a few panic-stricken moments, I could just barely move my fingers, only a little bit. I then felt that there was more than just a spasm. I felt dirty and touched. It was a horrible feeling from deep inside me. I could barely move my toes, again very slightly. My throat felt like it was being held. I could feel something was on top of me. My hands were by my side, but it felt like they were around my own throat, holding tightly. I was using all my might to break free from this spasmodic state. Then could feel something breathing into my left ear, the sound of a growl-like noise right next to my ear. I struggled to move my head to the left, like breaking free from a stranglehold. I could barely see the outline of a head, a big long head next to my own face. As the spasm-like feeling started to wear off, a tiny bit at a time, I could work out that this thing on top of me looked like a lizard, nuke thing. It was like a blending together of all that was around it, or maybe invisible. I'm not very sure which, but I could see it clearly as the seconds passed. It was a reptilian. I growled at it, or I think I did. My mind and my body gave all it could to do so. I bared my teeth at it, and I could feel it could read my mind. I was swearing at it, and shouting all sorts of obscenities at it. I felt violated and used. The next thing, it was quickly off of me, and was standing to one side of the bottom of my bunk bed. A light came through the thin gap in the curtains. There were different shades of golden light, which also had very small particles inside it like dust or small stars that moved around like little bright lights. This reptilian creature was about six feet tall. I could sense it was either proud or happy with itself, maybe both. I tried to sit up as best I could, and through my mind, I swore at it again. The creature walked forward and stepped into the light beam. As it did, the feet and legs vanished into the light. The more the creature moved forward towards the window, the more of it vanished. After it was gone I felt relaxed, but I could still feel where I was held around my throat. I felt I was physically violated by this horrendous monster. I awoke to a bright sunny day. I could hear my mother downstairs, washing up and doing housework. I lay in my bed and didn't move a muscle. I ran the incident through my mind again, and yes, I could still feel where I was held around my throat. I know this happened. My mind, heart and soul know that this happened. For the life of me, I could not run downstairs to explain to my mother about this. Who would have believed it? How would my parents have handled such a thing? I did not know what to do. Since that night, my stepfather passed away. 
I asked my mother if she believed in aliens or UFOs. She replied that my stepfather said once that he saw a UFO near Brighton, East Sussex, while at sea in the 1960s, and he swore that it was a UFO, but only told my mother this. I never told my mother about my experience, as I thought it would be too harrowing for her to hear. What do I do about my experience? I would love to do something about it. It may help somebody, as I am being very honest. Things like this should be disclosed. An answer has to be found on why this is happening. I've struggled with this for several reasons, as it regards the death of a close friend that is possibly tied to her very traumatic encounter with a large male Sasquatch. Attached you will find a photo of my dear friend Pamela Pam Porter from Ohio. I first met Pam in March 2009. We instantly became best friends. There was such a strong connection, it was as if we had known each other forever. We were on an expedition at the time I met her, and it was immediately very apparent that not only was Pam a fearless researcher, she was a very she was very determined to have a direct encounter with Sasquatch. As we visited and got to know each other. She told me she would often go jogging alone late at night in the forests, near her home hoping for a face to face. She pushed the envelope in every possible way, and I fear that the encounter she had in 2007 in Hanobia, Oklahoma may have led to her death. There was a lot of buzz on that 2009 trip about what had happened to her in Oklahoma, and she very graciously shared the details with the entire group. She was very matter of fact about all of it. I will do my best to recount it to you, and in her own words. Pam's account. When I arrived at the expedition in Oklahoma, I learned that there was an area where there had been several encounters with a very aggressive male. I volunteered to spend the night camping alone in that area. Three other members took me to the spot this male was known to frequent, and helped me get my tent set up. We were waiting for M.M. to bring me a thermal camera, and some recording equipment, and I asked them to move away away about 150 yards as I could sense that the mail was close. It was late afternoon nearing dusk. I became aware that the mail was indeed very close. I was catching glimpses of him through the underbrush, and he began shaking trees and vocalizing. I held my ground and began talking calmly to him. His aggression grew, but I still held my ground, and before I knew it, I was being hit by what I believe was infrasound. My entire body began vibrating, and I was frozen in place, unable to move. Apparently, I keyed my radio a couple of times, but was unable to communicate with the guys. They were on the radio with MM relating to him what was happening, and he ordered them to run to me as quickly as they could, and get on either side of me to block the infrasound if possible. I don't remember much about them running to me, but apparently, they heard the male moving away as they arrived. It took a good while to regain my composure, and be able to speak, but I still wanted to spend the night. M.M. offered to stay there with me. The rest of the night was uneventful, and the male did not return. The next morning I woke completely drained and exhausted. I was unable to participate in any of the activities of that day, and ended up leaving the expedition early on the following day and driving home. Over the next few weeks, I was so drained and exhausted that when I would go to work, I would end up sleeping in the conference room all day. I eventually saw my doctor, and as soon as they got the results of my blood work he called and told me to come to the hospital immediately. I learned that half of my blood volume had mysteriously disappeared. They never could find out what had caused it. I had a blood transfusion that day, and they continued every two weeks for months, until I was finally able to go to one transfusion a month. At the time I met Pam she was still getting blood transfusions every month, and she was still fearless and pushing for another encounter. She was diagnosed with cancer later that year, and it had already spread when it was diagnosed. She died in July 2010 at 37 years old and I'm still heartbroken over her loss, especially so because she was very afraid of death. It's so ironic that she was fearless in life, but afraid to die. I did a great deal of research on infrasound after being present when two different friends were hit by it. We had proof that it was indeed infrasound that incapacitated one of my friends, 
as he was wearing a recorder with a mic on his hat when it happened, and the recorder picked up the top end of the infrasound range. It also picked up a buzz at the moment he was hit. His experience was brief, but it took him to the ground, and he had blood in his urine for two weeks after that event. I had a friend who was a former Navy pilot who had since retired, and was a military contractor working for Leon Panetta. He shared a lot of information with me about infrasound, including the fact that the military not only uses it for crowd control, but they can target a single individual in the middle of a crowd and take them down. Here is a summary of what my research revealed. Infrasound is a very low frequency sound below 20 Hz, which can travel long distances and easily penetrate most buildings and vehicles. Transmission of long wavelength sound creates biophysical effects such as nausea, loss of bowel control, disorientation, vomiting, potential internal organ damage, and in extreme instances death. Infrasound is in-band end meaning it does not lose its properties when it changes mediums such as from air to tissue. Infrasound induces stress and causes the body to secrete the hormone cortisol produced by the adrenal gland. Cortisol plays a vital role in preparing our body for stressful fight or flight episodes. During long-term stress or if cortisol production is prolonged its effects on the human body can be deadly. They include hypoglycemia, brain damage, weakening of the immune system, weight gain, diabetes, and high blood pressure. Infrasound waves hug the ground, travel for long distances without losing strength, and are unstoppable. Not much amplitude is needed to produce negative effects in the human body, and even mild exposure requires several hours or even days to reverse the symptoms. I personally believe that infrasound is not the only weapon in the Sasquatch arsenal, but I do know it's one of them. Here is how I gained a stalker. When I was 19 I went on Craigslist casual encounters to find some NSA hookups. 99% of the people that responded to my ad were either dudes or fake. One girl messaged me, and she seemed cute and was real. She lived about an hour away from me, and we chatted back and forth and followed each other on MySpace, it was 2008. So we decide to meet up, get dinner then go to a hotel and do things. I get to her house and am greeted by a drunk middle-aged woman in the driveway her mom. I eventually meet X. She was about 100 pounds heavier than all the pictures, had a huge neck tattoo that said F, and had multiple facial piercings and rainbow-colored hair. I was horny and swallowed all my standards. Had dinner, went to the hotel and banged it out. Next day I drop her off at her house, she said thanks I needed that see you never. She unfriended me on MySpace and made no attempt to contact me after so I was like cool a one night stand. About a week later it's late at night and I hear pounding on my front door. This freak found my address in the phone book and wanted to see me. She rambled about getting kicked out of the house, and her mom told her to go live with her boyfriend. I explained that is not possible. To get to my house she has to take a bus to a train station in Providence Rye, take a train to Boston South Station, then take another train south to my town, then walk 5 miles to my house. Wicked spooky I am really freaked out, and she starts crying and asks to get dropped off at the train station and I oblige. Before she gets out of the car I tell her I'm really not comfortable with her, and that I don't think she should contact me again. For the next few weeks my phone gets blown up non-stop by her always at sleeping hours. All day and all night calls and text. I changed my number and stopped using my AIM messenger. I finally got some breathing room and a month or so passed. Zero dark 30 I'm sleeping. Pounding on the door again she's back this time with some morbidly obese gothic girl. They start yelling at me about how since we had sex I'm her boyfriend now. My mom eventually comes to the door and starts yelling at them and threatens to call the police. They leave and drive off in some shitball car. They showed up at my work a few days later, and they did not realize I was interning for a public safety department at a local college spooked them. I told the people I worked with about them, and they spooked them straight since the guys looked like police officers. I have not heard from her in 8 years, so I think they did a good job. 
However there are lots of freaks on the internet, and they seem to live on Craigslist. About six years ago, my now husband, Josh, and I moved to Northern Kentucky for work. Northern Kentucky is part of a tri-state area with Ohio and Indiana. This was our first apartment that was larger than a shoebox, and we were looking for some extra counter space. We found the perfect microwave card on Craigslist, so Josh called up the, the seller, who seemed perfectly normal. The address was on Ren RD in Ross, which we assumed was in Kentucky. We also assumed based on our own experiences with waterfront property on the East Coast, that it would be a nice neighborhood, as it was right on the Ohio River. So we mapped out our route and went on our way in our Mustang convertible with a top down. It was just getting dark outside at this point. After a considerable drive, and after passing the road by accident, we found it. In addition to the street sign, which was mostly hidden by bushes and trees, it was marked with some very faded wooden signs which we couldn't read very well in the dark. Those signs probably should have been our first inclination that something wasn't right, but we vaguely took notice and turned down the street. Upon going over a small hill that included railroad tracks going perpendicular to the road, we bottomed out and lost our muffler. So with our car's now extra loud engine, we came out of the trees into a small trailer park. There were about five trailers on each side of the road, which ended in a cul-de-sac. Immediately we were a bit nervous, having not expected a scene like this. Josh pulled the car in and turned it around so we were facing the exit. Immediately, the inhabitants of the trailer park, who had all been standing together talking, came over and surrounded our car. I was pretty much panicking at this point, and was nudging Josh, just wanting to get out of there. The large, beer-bellied, redneck man, who seemed to be the spokesperson of the group, asked angrily what we were doing there. Josh told him we were there about the microwave cart from Craigslist. The man said, Craigslist? Nah, we don't got nothing like that here. What'd you say you were looking for? At this point, Josh is calling the woman he had spoken to on the phone, and there are about eight people all around our car. Luckily for us, they were not at the front of the car. The woman answers the phone, Josh realizes we're obviously in the wrong place, apologizes a few times, and we floor it out of there. On the way out we go over the hill and bottom out again. Speaking to the woman on the phone, we realize that she was on Ren RD in Ross Township, Ohio. We set off for her actual residence, and claimed our microwave card at her nice, normal suburban home. We were scared shitless and our car was even louder than normal, but we were safe. There are plenty of lessons to be learned from others who've dealt with Craigslist creeps, but we still use it when necessary, and haven't really had any actual issues. One lesson we did learn though, riverfront property in the Midwest is the complete opposite of beachfront property on the East Coast. So though we don't live anywhere near the Midwest now, creepy trailer park rednecks, let's not meet. I've played World of Warcraft since the beginning. I've met some really amazing people, and some really awful people. This is about the worst guy I've ever met. I wanted to start raiding for the first time in an expansion called Warlords of Dreener. I was a tank and joined a raiding guild. My other tank was a monk. In the beginning, everything was fine. There was a brief moment where I think he was taken aback that I was a girl, because he asked me if I didn't realize that warriors couldn't heal, but I ignored it and moved on. Monk and I would talk on the side to talk about general tanking strategies, or we would try out things to see if our class was better at different things. There was nothing ever romantic between us because I was in a long-term relationship. Ironically she introduced me to WoW. We eventually got to become, what I thought, was close friends. We played for close to a year together. We had also branched out to other co-op games while still playing WoW. At the same time, my girlfriend now wife and I were moving where she got an intern opportunity, and we were moving maybe an hour away from him. So we decided to meet. The meetup was kind of weird, to be honest. He was kind of awkward, but so was I. 
we just make it through and continue being friends. Another few months go by and Monk and I are still talking and playing pretty consistently. He's quit WoW at this point, but we are playing other stuff together. One night I tell him my girlfriend's brother was coming to visit. I hadn't seen him in close to two years because we lived far away, so I was incredibly excited. I mention my excitement to the monk, and he flips out, demanding why her brother is allowed to visit before he visits again. And how is he going to spend his time if I'm not there? I end up flatly telling him that he needs to figure that out by himself. I must have struck a nerve because man goes ballistic, and starts spamming my phone with calls that I ignore and messages that I also mute. So he does the next logical move, and puts my name, picture, and address on Craigslist personals. I get hounded in my apartment for hours, and I only realize what's happened because someone pulls up the ad on his phone to angrily gesture at it. It's a mess for a while afterwards. We end up staying in a hotel for a few days as we talk to police. The police say they can't really do anything because there's no proof he was the one that did anything. Fine, that's fair. The police also tell me that I need to tell him, I don't want to talk to him anymore so I text him, and he sends back a message apologizing for putting my information up. I debate filing the restraining order then, but I'm so beat down that I choose not to. It's a big mistake. He messages me on everything he can find of me. I block him as soon as I can, but he's messaging me on Tumblr and Twitter and Steam, and just overall overwhelming me. I file a restraining order. He's quiet for a few months afterwards, and I hope that's the end, but for one last hurrah, he sends me $200 on Venmo telling me that he, did it again, and he needs someone to talk to. I just ignore it. It's been two years since everything happened, and I started playing WoW again. I'm learning to love it again. We're still on the same server, and I worry about running into him. But I'm too poor to transfer my characters off so guess I'm stuck. Anyways Tank who got all intense on me, let's not meet. As the day of our big move approached, my friend handed me an old exercise bike she had obtained years ago at a yard sale. We decided it was time to part ways with it, and not wanting to burden ourselves with unnecessary items during the move, I thought of listing it for a mere $100 on a local marketplace. To be honest, I had modest expectations, thinking I might be lucky to get $20 for this relic of a workout machine. To my surprise, someone showed interest almost immediately. A guy named Mark messaged me, expressing his excitement about the exercise bike. He was thrilled by the prospect of owning it, and was willing to pay the full $100 without any negotiation. Puzzled but not one to question a good deal, I agreed to the sale. We arranged to meet at our old house on the very day we were moving out. It seemed convenient enough, and I figured it would be a safe transaction. As Mark arrived, I could see the genuine excitement in his eyes. It was as if he had stumbled upon a hidden treasure. Without hesitation, he eagerly handed over $100, and started inspecting the 20-year-old exercise bike with delight. The bike, a heavy and somewhat outdated piece of exercise equipment, didn't seem to have any intrinsic value. I couldn't help but wonder why Mark was so enthusiastic about it. However, he didn't seem to mind. He loaded the exercise bike onto his vehicle all by himself, still beaming with joy. The whole situation was both amusing and puzzling. Curiosity got the better of me after the sale. I decided to do some research and googled the model of the exercise bike. Surprisingly, I found that there was absolutely no significant value to it, other than being a heavy piece of scrap metal. It made me chuckle to think that I had just made $100 from something I thought would barely fetch $20. Reflecting on the experience, I realize that sometimes, perceived value can be subjective. What may seem like an old, unwanted item to one person might be a source of genuine excitement for another. Mark walked away with his newfound treasure, and I walked away with an unexpected $100 in pocket. It was a win-win situation, proving that sometimes, the true worth of an item lies in the joy it brings to its new owner, 
even if that joy is inexplicable to the seller. And so, with one less heavy item to move, I chuckled at the quirks of life, and the unexpected turns a simple exercise bike could bring into a day of moving chaos. Moving into my first apartment brought with it the excitement of newfound independence, and the need to furnish my humble abode on a budget. Scouring Craigslist for deals, I stumbled upon a listing for a tiny George Foreman grill that seemed to fit my needs perfectly. Little did I know that this seemingly mundane purchase would lead to one of the strangest and unforgettable encounters of my life. Arranging to meet the seller at his apartment, I found myself standing outside a nondescript building, wondering what kind of person I was about to encounter. The door opened, revealing an older, extremely skinny man with a peculiar haircut that reminded me of the circular shape often associated with monks. This gentleman, whom I'll refer to as Mr. Told de Sac, warmly invited me inside to showcase the grill. As I entered his sparsely furnished home, I couldn't help but notice the emptiness of the space. There were a few scattered boxes, a dinner table, and not much else. It was a peculiar setting, but my focus remained on the grill I came to purchase. Mr. Called the sack, eager to demonstrate the grill's capabilities, offered to cook a snack for me. The bizarre turn of events unfolded as he placed three pieces of bologna on the tiny George Foreman grill. The sizzle of the meat and the aroma filled the room, creating an odd ambience. I watched, slightly bewildered, as he meticulously cooked the bologna. It was an unexpected cooking show in the midst of what should have been a straightforward transaction. To my surprise, Mr. Cold de Sac then proceeded to devour the freshly grilled bologna right before my eyes. It was an eccentric display that left me wondering if I had unintentionally stumbled into a parallel culinary universe. The strangeness of the situation peaked when, without warning, he handed me the still burning hot grill. Feeling a mix of confusion and awkwardness, I placed the grill in an empty box he had lying around, using it as a makeshift container. I thanked him, hastily left his peculiar domain, and contemplated the odd encounter on my way back to my apartment. As I settled into my new place, the tiny George Foreman grill stood as a reminder of that surreal experience. It became a story to share with friends, a tale that started with a simple Craigslist purchase, but unfolded into an unexpected journey into the eccentricities of a stranger's culinary world. Little did I know that a quest for a budget-friendly appliance would leave me with not just a grill, but a memory etched in the annals of my apartment living adventures. Story time. I spent the last six months living inside an abandoned RV. This was not by choice. I've spent a long time thinking about to word this. As time's gone on it's becoming clear to me that I should be honest about my mistakes although I have no desire to give my identity away. Still, I can't just stay silent. So, should I start this like a talk at a conference? Should I slowly work my way to some massive justification for my life's work? I could tell you how my work could, potentially, have offered new ways to deliver complex medicines, or offered philosophical insights into the past and future of life's organization, or even created blueprints for strange new robotics that would let mankind conquer the stars. Or maybe, perhaps, I should actually be honest. I studied slime molds, and I did it because I liked feeling like the smartest person in the room, so I picked a topic few people could challenge me on. The problem was that I was very impressive to most lay people, but within my field I wasn't particularly well recognized. I dealt with taxonomic classification, and was, for all intents and purposes, a lab assistant. Our field team collected lots of samples, and someone had to organize them, categorizing the molds and ordering them, looking for anything that stands out. I've joked that I've discovered more species than any other scientist, I just never got the credit. That might actually be true. But it's also true that I spent almost all my time running through a fixed battery of tests. Researchers sent me dirt, I developed cultures, tested them, and if anything was unusual I would send it off to a genetics lab for testing. 
Any papers that got published would have me listed as an author, usually sixth or seventh, I was forever lost in the annals. But for almost 99% of the time, the tests came back with the same old results. Somewhere above me were other more celebrated scientists who were looking for novel species that might do strange new things. That's where the robotics and medicine stuff comes from, of course. Don't forget, penicillin was a mold, just like the things I look at. But I wasn't saving the world. I was doing the same old shit day in and day out. Mine was the boring work that needed doing to save other people time and money, while I jealously waited for a chance to prove myself to the older academics. That chance, I thought, came with Melissa. It started with a small sample of mold sent to me along with hundreds of others, one I would later come to name Melissa after my late sister whose favorite color was turquoise. To this day I don't know exactly where Melissa came from, just that the note on her file seemed like a joke to me, so I ignored it researchers occasionally slipped references into the notes for a bit of fun. Either way, Melissa was one of many strange unidentified organisms who we share this world with, picked out of some dark forgotten corner where she had been overlooked, and then shepherded to my small basement level laboratory. She was a shimmering, almost metallic beauty with vivid pulsing veins spread along her pastel cloudy hues. She looked like a psychedelic explosion caught in time, and staring at her microscopic structure, felt like being transported to an alien world. Even at first glance, I knew she was going to be special. And oh boy was she, starting with the fact she never got a single maze wrong. She could home in on food with remarkable accuracy, the kind you might expect from an actual organism. After about 50 trials I was getting ready to write up the unusual nature of Melissa's success, when I noticed the sample in the maze had what appeared to be some kind of dirt in it. A closer look showed a tiny black orb the size of a salt grain embedded in her bluish flesh. They reminded me an awful lot of a clam's eyes, and acting on a hunch, I decided to place some card that obscured the location of the nutrient packet, and then run a few more trials. I remember thinking it was such a stupid idea. If anyone had asked why I'd done it, I would have struggled to come up with a sane idea. Eyes are multicellular and complex. Slime molds are simple. That kind of specialization just doesn't exist in their kingdom, even in the more complex fungi. But Melissa was full of surprises. What she did next was quite really quite remarkable. She simply crawled up the maze wall, regrew her eyes for it was now clear to me that they were eyes in a new location and used the vantage point to identify which branch to use before solving the maze all over again. I must have repeated that experiment a hundred times, but eventually exhaustion got the better of me, and I called it a day. Before I left, I sampled Melissa to grow another dozen samples, providing them with plenty of nutrition to encourage growth. I knew that the next day I'd need to go through an awful lot of very rigorous tests, and I very much wanted to be prepared. When I returned the following morning, I was utterly enthralled to discover that Melissa's growth was successful. I now had over a dozen independent samples of her, which meant I needn't worry about working with a limited supply. Once again I set off to work, and while I can't go into tremendous detail, I will say that Melissa was truly something special. Over time it became obvious to me that she possessed rudimentary powers of information processing and could readily call into effect cellular specializations with as little as 60 minutes preparation. Of course that might not sound very incredible to you, but try growing a third eye in one hour, and let me know how easy you find it. And there were more than just eyes. There were special fibers, microscopically shaped like small springs that, under certain electrochemical signals, could tighten. These were no more than a few nanometers across. But in one demonstration Melissa wove hundreds of thousands across a wall well, a bit of playing card I'd sellotaped to the maze, and buckled it to clear a path to food. In another demonstration she used specialized digestive juices to break down a plastic wall, chemically engineering the necessary enzymes to break apart the laminated business card. I had to work with very limited supplies you see. In another set of trials performed in total darkness, she grew a myriad of tiny hairs across her surface, and used them to detect faint vibrations in the air. 
Not only did she use this to solve the maze in record time, tracking an artificial beeping sound, I used to indicate the correct path, but she later used this same trick to recognize sounds like my footprints. Pretty soon Melissa learned to detect the correct path, just by the sound of the food packet being dropped into place, regardless of light conditions, so I had to create dummy packets to properly control the experiment. There was no end to her magic. When I presented her with some acid-resistant plastic Tupperware to you and I, Melissa developed a series of chitinous hooks to grind and tear it apart. Of course, it took four hours, but it looked quite ferocious when sped up, like a sea of knives come to life. Fascinatingly, I also found that if I trained one sample of Melissa with half of a puzzle solution, and trained another sample with the other half, that once combined the two samples would successfully integrate both halves and solve the problem completely. In fact, just a few cells from one sample transferred to another could impart significant knowledge. By the time the day ended, there must have been a large amount of knowledge spread out between the 12 samples. Melissa was a once-in-a-lifetime discovery, and I so desperately wanted her to myself. I was going to do my tests, I decided, record them appropriately, and have all the proof necessary to show everyone that I was more than just a lab monkey to be overlooked. I left work that day feeling ecstatic, barely able to contain my excitement. This was the kind of thing that would have people from every department knocking on my door. Computer scientists, neuroscientists, psychologists, mathematicians and doctors alike would all want to work with me. I fantasized all evening about cancer curing molds trained to detect and consume tumorous tissue, plastic eating organisms solving world pollution, and engineered molds that could grow enough nutritious fruit to end world hunger. Unfortunately, the next day I returned to find that someone had nudged the 12 individual samples closer together, possibly looking for more room on one of the shelves in the refrigeration unit. Either way, Melissa sensed herself and reached out across the various dishes cracking lids where necessary and reassembled her various parts into a single sample. It was no larger than a dinner plate by the time, but it meant none of my individual samples could be tracked. Any hope of continuing specific experiments from the before were dashed, and I had to resolve to start all over again. Or at least, that was my intention. Unfortunately, some of the tricks Melissa had learned were quite vivacious. Initially I tried lifting her with my latex gloved hands, but soon felt a prick as I slid my finger between the glass shelf and her cold flesh. Pulling my hand away I noticed a small needle-like protuberance embedded in my flesh. It was hardly deadly, but afterwards I found myself feeling trepidation at the thought of touching her again. I'd never been stung before, and certainly never by my own work. Still, a nearby spatula let me pry her away, and I quickly set to work with some knives. I'll admit to feeling a bit reprehensible as I watched Melissa struggle. First, she oozed thick acid to try and melt the knife, but that was futile. She tried fixing some of her microscopic filaments to my skin and the handle, perhaps to gain some leverage, but she was far too slow, and they snapped pitifully as I sawed away. I watched as her flat, glistening form rippled in display threats, and also saw strange patterns of hooked flesh that looked much like the inside of a shark's mouth rise and clash against the cold steel to no effect. Eventually, and this was the part I found hardest to deal with, Melissa stopped her attacks and grew even more primitive black eyes and furry patches of ear to watch her own mutilation. And of course, to watch me. She never flinched though, not even after I had separated her into dozens of pieces, that sadly never stopped trying to reach each other. After that she became non-compliant. She stopped trying to solve the maze, and instead focused solely on me. The only instance of activity I ever saw was when I dropped a small paper clip on the testing area and Melissa assimilated it before I had chance to reach it. I tried pinching it out as she sucked it into her pliable body, but succeeded only in getting stung once more, this time by a far longer and slightly curved proboscis that javelined out towards my hand by a good five or six inches. I laughed at the time, amazed at how there was no end to her marvelous abilities, and simply accepted the loss of stationery. 
But afterwards I found myself increasingly disappointed with just how difficult it was to get any work done with such a hostile subject. That was a disappointing day. There was no testing or growth of any kind, just me bumbling about as I presented novel stimuli in the hope of eliciting new behaviors. By the time that day ended I wondered if Melissa had learned as much about me as I had about her, and I sullenly returned the various Petri dishes back to the fridge. That later turned out to be a mistake. The fridge was filled with over a hundred other samples, and I returned the following day to find them destroyed. Not only was this a grotesque loss of over three months worth of my academic work, but it appeared that Melissa had absorbed precious specimens and contaminated herself along the way. Strange fibrous protrusions crossed various shelves and Melissa, now significantly larger than before, was slowly turning every other sample around her a glistening iridescent shade of turquoise. I decided that I would no longer be able to do this on my own. Melissa was simply too tenacious, and the stress was already robbing me of sleep. I'd barely been in the lab for an hour and already I could feel a headache coming on. The stress and excitement were getting to me, so decided to bring in a colleague to cover for me while I rested. If anything, it'd be good for them to confirm my prior findings. I reached out to a good friend, whose identity I can no more share than my own, who arrived at my door only a few minutes later. They looked awfully concerned as I sat and explained each and every one of my experiments to them. The poor man was obviously incredulous at my claims, but by this point I was so exhausted and my nose so blocked and my stomach so sore that I had no desire to argue with him. Look, I said. The sample is in there and it speaks for itself. Just take a look while I catch up on some sleep and then you can apologize at not trusting me. He laughed at that and let me go on my way, probably because I was so clearly tired and disheveled that he felt the need to humor me. I might have been surprised at how bad I felt at the time, but I've long since been familiar with just how bad sleeplessness and exhaustion can affect the mind and body. Old cuts don't heal, slight infections grow aggressive, colds are prolonged, headaches more severe. Even as I collapsed onto the cot, I took a moment to consider just how badly swollen Melissa's stings were. They throbbed and ached, stinking of infection, and I decided I'd need a course of antibiotics, if they showed no sign of healing by the time I woke up. Then, with blurry vision and a pulsing headache, I quickly drifted off to thoughts of Nobel Prizes. For the first time in two nights, I found myself dreaming. They were profoundly unusual dreams, even for someone who studies slime molds all day, looking much like beautiful fractal patterns and brightly colored shimmering flesh. It was as if someone had turned a living person into some kind of modern art, taking the vivid and rich purples of bruised flesh and the pallid sickly yellow of jaundiced skin and intertwined them, weaving a tapestry out of threaded skin and nerves. It was all a dizzying kaleidoscope of abstract sensations and images that left me feeling deeply sick. So much so that the first thing I did when I awoke was vomit into a nearby wastebasket. God, what a rancid mix that was, that which fell sloppily out of my open mouth, as I shook feverishly over the bin, barely able to hold myself upright. There were visible blood vessels buried in that strange rainbow-colored spew, thick blue capillaries that shivered and moved like dying fish. I decided in that moment that I desperately needed to visit the doctor and went to tell my colleague about my need to leave work smiling to myself that I'd also get to hear him tell me I was right about the miracle mold only to be confused when I saw him lying on the floor through the glass partition. Somehow, and I'm still not sure how, my friend must have slipped during the testing. On the countertop was a slick pool of blood and his head was open from a nasty gash just above the ear, quite likely from where he struck the counter as he fell. Panicking, I pushed open the door and pulled my phone out ready to call emergency services. But after looking up I was forced to stop after only a few steps. The lower half of my friend was covered in the bumpy irregular shape of Melissa, whose slimy and embrace had inched its away up his legs like he was a fallen tree waiting to be digested. My God, I cried out and ran forward. Starting at the sound, my friend opened his eyes and looked at me in a daze, most likely unaware of what was happening. 
Don't worry Harold, I cried. I'll get it off. I reached forward and grabbed a thick lump of Melissa, she was now easily a meter squared in size, and as thick as a deck of playing cards, but I instantly felt a terrible pain shooting up my arm. Good God it hurt. It hurt worse than anything I've ever felt, like a hundred thousand tiny burns. Immediately blood flowed out from under my gloves, and I tore my hand away with a terrible sound, not unlike velcro straps being pulled apart. What was left of my skin looked like a fleshy cicatrix, and under other circumstances I might have fainted out of sheer pain. But my screaming had awakened something in Melissa, and she reared herself upwards like tsunami, and revealed a terrible sight. There was barely anything left of my friend below the waist. She had dissolved muscle and skin, leaving only softening bone in a yellowish stew that gurgled audibly. I looked back at my friend with new horror. He shouldn't have been alive. Slowly his mouth opened, and he rasped, without moving his lips. Help, in a voice that wasn't his. Get away, I screamed, and suddenly his torso lunged at me. It filled me with terror, the way he moved like a tongue to Melissa's lips, hungrily searching for me. It was almost like a punch in Judy doll, his body visible only from the waist up, the puppeteer hidden by the curtain of rippling mold that coated his legs. I easily kicked his hands away from my legs, and just as quickly as I had entered, I fled the lab and slammed the door shut behind me. Pressing my back up against it, forcing it shut, I took a moment to catch my breath, jumping momentarily when the door jostled from Melissa. She could sense me beyond, and slowly a shadow was cast across the room from behind me as she slithered up the glass in search of my flesh. I turned and saw an enormous writhing mess of cilia and gaping sphincters that winked aggressively, sometimes bearing teeth, hungrily pressing against the glass like a starfish at an aquarium. Then came a familiar hissing as digestive juices began to break down the door, and its wooden frame. Quickly I stepped away, just in time to avoid a dozen spindly spider-like legs flicker under the gap towards my heels. It was clear to me now that I had grossly underestimated Melissa. I could no longer act like she was anything but a direct and immediate threat to my life, so I decided to go for the simplest solution of all. I lit the room on fire, starting with the door she was trying to break apart. Thankfully there were lots of dangerous chemicals on hand, and they all burned very, very hot. It was actually quite odd watching her react to that ancient threat. Melissa quickly realized that the only exit was blocked by the flames, and many of our laboratories are designed to be controlled environments with very little risk of contamination, offering her few routes to leave. I could never really say if she did or didn't escape of course. I just knew I needed to aggressively stop her getting through. I also decided that perhaps my best chance was to disappear, maybe even hope that the half-eaten remains of my charred colleague might be mistaken for my own body. That's not to say I had a clear plan in my head as I fled the lab and university, rather just some kind of peculiar instinctual desire to flee which I did in a desperate and haphazard manner. I left my whole life behind that day, driven by some overwhelming compulsion to get the hell away from that room. In some ways, it was almost like my mind wasn't my own. It has since become clear to me just how stupid I was. I have been forced to live in this wretched broken down caravan, far away on a Hebridean isle somewhere in the North Sea. I'm not even entirely sure what's left of Melissa, or where she went after the fire. Sometimes I have apocalyptic nightmares of her slowly digesting the whole world, but I often remind myself that she was, after all, a natural species found on this earth. For all I know she just returned to wherever she came from, some obscure pit or dark underground chasm perhaps. Or perhaps she found the perfect place to hide already. Maybe she's like me, a scientist interested in exploration. In which case she's found herself quite the playground. What things will she learn there, I wonder, if only it didn't have to be so painful. It was only recently that I awoke and went to touch my feverish head, wiping away the sweat. But I was startled to find that what touched my moist skin was not my hand at all. It felt like an awful lot like a sock. I forced my eyes open, and I saw that a thick teal velvet glove had somehow been placed on my hand. 
I tried, quickly, to peel it off like it was a glove, but my thumb sank into the flesh below like I'd grabbed a piece of rotten fruit. Slowly, the horror dawned on me, and I tentatively reached forward and snapped a finger off. It crumpled in my hand, effervescing powder into the still air as I crushed it in one fist. Slowly, my sanity fading, I crumbled the rest of my hand apart until I was left staring at the pulsating hairy flesh of my exposed arm. Even the bone was soft like papier machete. Since then, it's just kept getting worse. And the dreams. Oh God, if I could just sleep in peace, then maybe it wouldn't be so bad. Still, I do have one consolation left. At least I finally get to be part of something bigger than myself. This happened to me while on a night fishing trip with a friend in Ohio in 2016. We had a place to park and hiked in three quarter of a mile, maybe a little further. We found a decent spot and had a small clearing. We weren't out in the middle of nowhere. However, this was not a place where you would expect to run into anyone. As a matter of fact, the spot looked as if it hadn't been used for a good long while, surrounded by tall trees, very tall grass, and some muddy swamp-like areas that were absolutely covered in tracks. I sat and tried to identify as many as I could. I've always had a fascination with tracking. I think I know why and I'll mention it at the end. I cannot believe how many tracks I found as if this area still belonged to nature. Deer, raccoon, coyote, turtle, and several different bird tracks. There were no human tracks and nothing out of the ordinary. It was a beautiful little fishing spot, with no noise pollution, and no sounds of human life. It was perfect. We set up camp after I scoped out the area. As it began to get dark a slight fog rolled in, and we put our jackets on, started a fire, and got our lines in the water. It was a very dark night, not much moonlight. But we had our fire and our headlamps for sight. At around 1 o'clock in the morning, my friend was cold and wanted to get warm in the car. I was not agreeable to this as I've been taught from a young age, and with many years of experience in the outdoors, this was not the ideal time to separate from each other. I reluctantly agreed, and we hiked back to the car. Now, had he been there for what happened next I might not have had to keep this to myself for all these years. I continued fishing, and was having a decent night. It was a catch and release trip and I had already landed a few nice sized channel catfish and a turtle. I was sitting in my chair and started thinking, I wonder how long he's going to be in the car. I really didn't want to be out there by myself in the middle of the night in such an isolated area. Keep in mind, the only noises were insects, frogs and turtles, and I spotted the eye shine of a raccoon in the trees directly across the river from where I sat. It was a peaceful night until this happened. I didn't smell anything and my hair didn't stand on end. However, I could feel it. The ground shaking that is, with every bipedal step this thing took shook the ground beneath me. I cannot describe the sound of these footsteps. Each step shook the ground around me for a split second. Earthquake crossed my mind, but it was just a fleeting thought, you know, when your brain tries to immediately make sense of something you can't explain. I had no idea how far off this thing was when it started, but I quickly realized it was running at me. I tried to regain my composure and remember hearing the last few steps. Boom, 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 and it was standing just out of the firelight right behind me in that very tall grass. Then it went quiet all around me. Silence, as if every living thing in that area knew to be quiet when it came to seeing what I was doing as if a room full of rowdy kids were just startled by the sight of their father. I remained quiet as well. I didn't dare shine a light in this direction. I'm convinced it was coming to investigate why I was there. I continued to fish as if nothing was wrong, even though I was scared, which is not a feeling I get very often when in the wilderness. I have a substantial amount of experience in the wilderness. I don't know which way it went, but I knew it had left when the cricket started back up. It left without making a sound. It was as if it wanted me to know it was there, but not where it went. If it had decided it didn't like the cut of my jib, I wouldn't be typing this to you now. Thank goodness it wasn't in the mood to rip me apart. I know it had to weigh every bit of 800 pounds. 
When I was sure it was gone, I drew my sidearm, as if that would stop this giant, and walked swiftly to the car to get my friend to come and help me carry our equipment out. I was done fishing. He was asleep with the heater, and the radio cranked way up. I'm almost positive if he had not had the radio on it would have woken him. I can't say what direction it came from exactly, but I think it may have either followed him or went to the car and checked him out first. He asked why I had my gun out and where was the equipment. I didn't say a word, I just told him I needed help to get it. We left shortly thereafter, and I didn't say much to anyone for the next couple of days. I know they Bigfoot exist, I always have. I didn't see it, as I didn't need to. I could have easily shined a light in this direction and laid eyes on it. I have no desire as there are many different beliefs surrounding these creatures, and simply laying eyes on one can be considered a sign of very bad luck. I can't remember where exactly I heard that, but I'm sure it came from the stories my great-grandfathers used to tell me. On my mother's side, her father was a full-blood Cherokee, and on my father's side, my great-grandfather was a Blackfoot. I believe this is where my fascination with tracking comes from. They are long past. I believe the stories they told were first-hand accounts, and not fabricated in the slightest. Those of us who know would give anything to that kind of knowledge. I encountered a reptilian hybrid a few years ago, while attending college in Oregon. This individual was extremely manipulative with words and dangerous with their deeds. Once I told him that he was a cold-blooded bastard after he humiliated a friend. He became very angry, staring at me with a hideous glare. He said I would suffer, for my disrespect. That night while studying in my dorm room, I was alarmed by a shadowy figure starting to manifest. I am sensitive to energy, so I immediately started to raise the vibration in the room. It quickly dissipated. That startled me, so I was on full alert. Later that night at approximately 2 am I awoke from what I thought was a dream, but alarmed by a grotesque reptilian form on top of my body attempting to choke me. It screeched and wailed like it was taking great delight in my fear and pain. I struggled and finally threw the fiend off me. As it cowered on the floor glaring at me, I immediately knew it was the individual I had insulted earlier. It thrust itself at me. I reached for my pants on my desk chair, in order to retrieve my pocket knife. It was choking me as I pulled the weapon from my pants pocket, and toiled to open the blade. I was able to push it off, long enough to slash it across its left arm and upper chest. With a howl of rage, it ran to the wall and disappeared through it. I turned the light on to fully illuminate the room, and noticed blood on the knife, bed sheets and floor. I checked myself to make sure it wasn't my blood. I was awake the rest of the night and ready to strike if I needed to defend myself. I was exhausted in the morning but made my way to class. I noticed the individual coming out of his dorm room. He had a bandage on his left arm in the same spot where I had cut the reptilian. He noticed me and walked directly to me nose to nose. He glared at me with those evil reptilian eyes. Watch your back because this isn't over he murmured. I walked past him and made my way to class. Later that day, the dorm staff and housing administrators wanted to talk to me. While I talked to one of the dorm staff regarding this individual, the administrator blurted out, don't provoke him, it's important that you not cause trouble for him. The dorm staff was obviously terrified of this guy and behaved like his minions. This was startling. That same night I felt wary of a presence watching me. That sense of dread continued for several weeks until I moved off campus to avoid this hostile individual. However, I often noticed him and his acquaintances blatantly watching me when I was on campus and in town. I know that I wasn't the only person affected by this guy, but no one ever dared to discuss it. Many strange things happened as well, including the sudden death of two students in that same dorm. No details of those deaths were ever disclosed, just that they died because of medical reasons. I know others are out there who are aware of the reptilians, and that there are ways that humanity can use to defend itself against them. I have been fortunate to meet several people who safeguarded themselves and family. 
These terrible beings are a scourge that we will continue to confront. Be safe. I would like to pass along a true story told to me by my grandfather when I was a young man. The story involves my great-grandfather, whose name was James McNamara. He was a patrolman in the New York City Police Department. This incident occurred in October of 1911 during the late evening hours. James was assigned to the theater district, in the area of Broadway and 42nd Street. Another patrolman, by the name of Dobbins, was two blocks south on Broadway near 40th Street. Theatergoers were walking about and enjoying the Great White Way, when suddenly screams were emanating from an alleyway just below James' position. Both patrolmen ran toward the ruckus, forcing their way through hundreds of fleeing pedestrians. As they reached the alleyway, a tall hairy beast ran out onto Broadway and towards 40th Street. Neither patrolman could believe what they saw. An eight-foot tall wolf with human-like arms and legs, running with skill and speed down the middle of Broadway. Soon the beast was facing a NYC Packard squad car, so it changed direction and moved back towards McNamara and Dobbins. The beast was growling as it moved forward. The patrolman took positions by a newsstand, hiding and waiting for the horrible creature to move before them. Soon the beast was at the entrance of another alleyway near 42nd Street. Both patrolmen pulled their revolvers and took deadly aim. The beast quickly dropped to the gutter. Immediately McNamara and Dobbins surrounded the body as other officers joined them. None of the public was allowed to come within 100 feet of the unknown canine. The body was quickly removed and taken to the mortuary. Both patrolmen were placed on other assignments. The squad was told by their superiors that this was simply a mistaken identity and that the deceased was a man in a costume. Of course, that was not the truth. The press was later told that a large mad dog caused the disruption, and that none of the public were injured. A few months later, a brief article was published in a Louisiana newspaper. I live in the Navajo Nation in Arizona. This took place in the Cheska Mountains in the 1980s. My friend was about six years old, and was up in the mountains for a family reunion at the family cabin. The cabin is in a meadow with a stone well near the tree line. They spent the day doing typical reunion things i.e. three-legged races, flag football, and whatnot. The sun starts setting and the families retire to the cabin and call it a day. The older people planned to sleep in the two bedrooms and the kids would sleep on a bed or cot set up in the living room. All was well and the kids were tucked into bed. My friend let's call her Sandra is uneasy and reluctant to go to sleep. She is wide awake as everyone falls asleep. Sandra tosses and turns, unable to shake her weird feeling. Suddenly her feeling turns immediately to fear as she hears something big, something heavy making its way across the porch. Sandra fears that it may be a bear looking for food, little did she know it would be much worse. She could make out the shadow of something large and black as it passed the window. It is making its way to the door. She sees that the family didn't lock the door. Sandra is watching the door, too scared to move or scream, she sees the doorknob rattle back and forth. Whatever is trying to open the door, succeeds. The room floods with the most putrid stench, and she sees a large human hand through the door. Sandra finally summons her strength to scream, Dad. Her father runs in and sees Sandra pointing at the door. He sees the hand, runs to the door, and yells, Hank, his brother grabbed the gun. Whatever was at the door ran. It was a full moon, and in the moonlight, they saw the creature run across the yard. Hank with a hunting rifle in hand looks through the scope, and sees the creature crouching behind the well. Sandra's father assumes it is a bear and tells Hank to shoot. Hank pulls the trigger and hears the bullet ricochet off the well. All thought of this being a bear is diminished instantly when the creature stands up on two feet and runs towards the tree line. They never saw the creature again. These are accounts from my partner I mentioned in the first post, for background his grandparents live there, 
and he would often go there for summers and breaks for school. It's unsettling and definitely informal since these were talked about in a group chat. There was one night when I was a kid when I couldn't sleep so I was sneaking out to the computer room to go play webkins or something silly, kid stuff. And as I was walking past those big wall to floor windows facing the woods leading to the computer room, there was something that wasn't quite a person and wasn't quite an animal on the back porch, crouched, pressing its face against the glass. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that video of the rabid coyote that is snarling up against a window or a glass door, and it's like smacking its muzzle into the glass all violently. It was like that, that same feeling of danger and wrongness, that little kid me was like almost hypnotized by it. It was just standing there and trying to push through the glass, and would sometimes smack whatever kind of mouth it had against the window like it was trying to bite or break the glass. But eventually I snapped out of it, and ran back to my room, and didn't come out until morning. Another one I was present over the phone was this. When we were long distance before 2020, he would call me frequently while I was doing school work. It was pretty late, and he calls me and says there was a massive shriek-like scream that happened down the road from him. If anyone is familiar with hearing a guttural scream, you know how unsettling and icing it can be. It freaked him out a bit, and we heard a crash happen. He lived off of a massive highway with crop fields on either side. The fields had these rain banks that ran between them and the highway that were about five, six feet deep. A little after the scream, we hear a crash, metal on metal of two cars crashing. Soon after, sirens flying from down the highway past his house. He has me on call and decides, as any Midwesterner would, to go see what's going on. He gets to the police barricade, and they tell him to turn around, and, you'll hear about it in the news. And that was it. He couldn't see super well, but there were police activity in the field, yards away, looking at two different, crumpled cars. The next morning, he goes out, and, while the wreck was cleared, there was still debris. There were signs of two cars being there, deep into the fields, like they had been tossed or thrown. No real news happened on it at all, besides town rumors that, drug deal went wrong, was the only explanation. Date was Deck 27, 2019. This is an account by a few of us, on this note from our document we share. The airport runway that goes on with no end at night, the woods and surrounding grass pulls you towards it. Strange shadows in the grass. There is an old airstrip near my partner's home at the time. It's one of those small, private aircraft runways with a few hangars, and no security at all. The runway is planted in a field, with lots of woods surrounding it. I've been to the airstrip a few times, and every time it was not fun. It scared me straight out of the gate, it was eerie and too silent to be in the woods. We've had a few interesting things happen, but the main one was not being able to walk to the end at night. On foot, you would be able to walk to the end of the strip in about 5-10 minutes during the day, and in a car both at night and day. On foot, we had never been able to reach the end at night. We had walked it several times just the two of us, or in a group with other friends, and every time, we could walk for what felt like hours with the dim lights of the runway stretching into the distance, never growing closer to the end. A few of our friends reported feelings of dizziness or wrongness on these walks. My partner told me stories about a junkyard that was also back in the same woods behind his grandparents' house. No fence or security, nobody else ever there, but cars or chunks of cars ranging back as old as the 70s in various states of disrepair, or with trees growing through them, or practically seeming to be sunken into the ground overgrown with bramble and weeds. He says the whole place was eerie quiet, no birds or animals around other than the faint smell of rot and rust or cat urine. One more, this one is on the night train. The last train of the night gave my partner, and the friend we had that lived in town nightmares. Our friend had them more often, but the train would seemingly run way too long, honking for hours. My partner mentioned when it came through, it would sound and shake like it was right outside when it was across town from both of them. The train noises would distort for me, waning and pitching incorrectly while making my hair stand on end. It felt wrong and horrible, 
causing panic attacks and terrors for my friends and me. This is a super long post, but I think it's worth it. Let me know if you have stories or know anything weird with this little town. So this happened when I was about 9 or something I'm not completely sure. My friend and I were playing in my room with Barbies, but took a quick break when she had to pee. I decided it would be fun to hide behind my door to scare her. When I stood up and wanted to hide behind my door, I saw some sort of creature. I always thought of it as some sort of alien, but it could be something else. It certainly did not look human though. I don't know exactly how it looked but I have a vague memory of its appearance because it's been so long ago. When I saw it, I felt intense fear. I could not move or breathe, and my heart was racing. I don't know how long I stood there, but eventually, I walked out of my room, and my friend came out of the bathroom. We both went back inside my room and resumed playing. At that moment, I did not remember what happened, but I still felt extremely scared. I must have looked scared too because she kept asking me if I was okay. I'm not sure when, but maybe a few days or weeks later, I started to remember what happened that day, and became extremely scared to sleep. I never told my parents and kept it to myself, they just had to deal with me being scared lol. I told my little brother a few years after it happened, but every time I talked about it, or every time he joked about it, he didn't believe me, I would freak out and this intense fear would fill up my body. The image of it standing there, and the fear I felt stayed with me. I recently talked about it with my oldest brother, because my younger one brought it up as a joke. My oldest brother really believes it could be an alien of some sort, since he also believes to have seen one when he was younger. Does anyone have the same experience or any idea what this could have been? I'm also planning to ask my younger brother, if he remembers me telling him any details about how it looked. I have always believed in spirituality and supernatural existence, but I have never had such a direct and validating first-hand experience with it. In July 2023, I was single and active on social media, dating apps, etc. I have an abundant mindset in dating, so I was messaging as many girls as possible, while I was single and looking to mingle. I had a false and idiotic sense of safety, apparently. I added a girl I had found on Tinder or something, but had never met in person on Snapchat, a normal occurrence during that time, unfortunately. Instantly, I watched her story, and it was full of witchcraft, fortune telling, and other stuff along those lines. Before I could even finish viewing the stories, I got a message like, who's this, which is super understandable of course. And before I had time to respond, this person, in under a minute of adding me, blurted out my grandmother's full name and address, her dog's name, my mom's legal name most people don't know it, and she never goes by it my childhood address, my current address and potentially other details I had forgotten. They basically threatened me to leave them alone and that they knew all this because one of their minions follows me. Of course, someone could find these things if they had enough information, time, and a bizarre desire for personal details. But we're talking 20 to 30 seconds or less. It was so fast in fact, that I don't even think it could have normally been typed up as fast as it was sent. It was as if it was copied and pasted. This shook me up enough to block them instantly, and to go through my followers and block any minion type people, lol. My family, including myself, had fallen upon some bad fortune since then, and I can't shake the slight paranoia that perhaps this person had cast something onto us. If you have any insight, thoughts, or questions on this, please comment, as I want to better understand what I experienced. I'm just gonna start by saying that this story isn't quite as interesting as some of the others, but I still feel like it's worth sharing. So this happened a few weeks ago Super Bowl weekend on a Saturday. One of my buddies came to visit me, and brought some of his friends with him, so there were four of us. Us being college kids, we did a lot of drinking that night, and by the end, we were all pretty drunk. But I remember I, for whatever reason, 
was challenged to go lift something at my 24-7 gym that's right across the street at about 3.15 ish am. Me being drunk ass at this point said sure and went and did it. It wasn't until I started walking back that I saw a man in a suit with a fedora. Mind you, the road was completely empty, no one else on the sidewalks, just me and this man. I didn't think anything of it until I started walking back to my apartment, and he was just staring at me the entire time while walking in the opposite direction. I got to my apartment doors and noticed he turned the corner. When I got back to my apartment, I told my buddy and his friends what had just happened, and how creepy the whole thing was, especially since it was at 3.30 am. I know it's a possibility that since I was drunk, I may have seen something different than what was real. But I definitely felt something was very off, and when I told everyone, I remember feeling really rattled about it. What's y'all's opinion? In 1888, a mine owner reported his encounter with a 60-foot-long serpent monster, while crossing the Jornada del Muerto volcanic crater in New Mexico. What did he encounter? This section of the country has been considerably aroused from time to time by the conflicting reports of Mexicans, who say that the extinct crater to the east of the plain, known as the Jornada del Muerto, about 25 miles from this place, is the abode of a monster serpent, second in size only to that huge reptile of the seas that has so often been spoken of by mariners and others. It is reported by some to be fully 100 feet in length, and about 2 feet in circumference, but probably the most trustworthy information, is that given by a Mr. Alexander, who possesses some mining property in the San Andreas Mountains, which lie to the east of the broad plain. Mr. F Alexander says that he saw the serpent once, while crossing the Jornada on the way to his mines. He was about halfway across the plain, jogging leisurely along behind his burrow, dreaming of the immense wealth that he hoped to realize from his property, when suddenly the burrow stopped, erected his long ears, wheeled quickly around, and made a mad stampede in the opposite direction. Mr. Besh Alexander was at a loss to account for this strange freak of the burrow, and was about to start in pursuit of the runaway when he chanced to look ahead. Then his eyes gazed upon the monster. He was so beside himself with fear at first, he says, that his nerves were completely paralyzed, his hair stood on end, and move he could not. He was rooted to the spot, and his eyes were fixed upon the serpent. It was about a quarter of a mile from him, and was traveling in the opposite direction toward the crater. He says it appeared to be about 60 feet in length, but what surprised him most was the queer proportions of the creature. The four parts were of enormous size, its head being fully as large as a barrel. A few feet behind the creature's head two large scales were visible which glittered in the sun like polished shields. Further back were two huge claws on either side, about two feet apart, which were all the monster had in the shape of feet. The rest of the body was comparatively small and tapering to the end of the tail. It traveled at a rapid gait, sometimes rearing its whole body from the ground, and walked on its four claws. He watched it till it disappeared over a little hill, and then he started to look after his burrow. The Mexicans have the most deadly fear of the crater, and will not venture within miles of it, there being a popular tradition among them, that it is the abode of some terrible serpent. The Mexicans assert that on one occasion, a descent of the crater was made by their men, and as none of them returned, it was generally believed they were devoured by the monster. Over 10 years ago, I was in my 20s, sharing a townhouse with my partner. We were an end unit, connected only on the right side of the home to the rest of the houses. Had lived there for at least a year maybe two when this happened, and during that time, never once heard a single sound coming from our neighbors who shared the other side of our wall. One night, probably 2 or 3 am, I woke up to the sound of our neighbor coughing. I immediately recognized how odd that was because we had never heard them at all through the wall. The coughing continued non-stop and appeared to get louder to the point where it no longer seemed to be coming from our neighbor. But now inside my bedroom, like the origin of the sound had drifted through the wall toward me. The sound continued to drift toward me, 
and I was started to breathe very heavily like I was scared out of my mind. As it came to me and settled what felt lime two feet directly over me, the sound kind of morphed into a mechanical sound very similar to a scene from The Matrix, where Neo's scream becomes synthesized. This crescendoed above me, and then suddenly stopped. My partner then woke up, not from the sound, but from the feeling of me panicking and breathing heavily. I told her what had happened, and she said something like, definitely just a weird dream half awake half asleep thing but you do seem really scared. We tried to go back to sleep, but within a few minutes the whole experience happened again, only this time, my partner could hear it all too, and we were silently gripping onto each other very tightly as it was happening, now both of us panicking. I don't know why we didn't say anything or get out of bed, but we both had a, we need to stay quiet and not draw attention to ourselves feeling. It happened the same as before, and when it was done, we both turned on our bedside lights and spent the rest of the night awake watching TV. I have never heard someone else have this same kind of experience. The thought of posting this here is to see if it rings true for anyone out there. Back when I was a small child, like 3-5 years I told my mom multiple times that my dad had a car accident and killed his friend and I was there. She would put this off as odd behavior, and not think much of it, until she once told my dad, and he was totally shocked and looked at her like an insane person. Came out that before he was with my mom, he had a girlfriend, and while driving the car slipped, and they crashed into a car, where she died. There was no kid in there, but we can't explain, how I knew it happened in the woods, and that it was a crash against a tree. There were no kids on the car. It might sound crazy, but I can't remember this incident very much now, but since my parents somehow were involved with this case, it stayed a bit more in my brain. I apparently talked a lot of dumb stuff like telling my mom, remember when I was an adult back then, I always did X sadly she didn't remember what exactly and I don't either, only that I somehow always felt as a kid, I had a connection to events of past lives, but then got severed once I got older. So this was a while back, but it just came back to me, and I saw this channel. And thought I'd see if anyone could help me figure this out. Some context, I live in Virginia and have my whole life, and I've heard stories about paranormal events here and experienced them in my small town. One night, driving home after work at about 3 am, I was very tired, and I saw something with bright yellow eyes and very dark fur. It looked like a wolf or something beautiful, my headlights were on it as it ran across the road and disappeared. It was not a normal animal. I know that. It moved faster than a wolf and didn't run like a deer would. Ever since then, I hate driving down that road, and when I think about it, I get the same feeling I did when I saw it. If anyone can help me understand what I saw or thinks it's a wendigo, please let me know. This story may just be one of dad's silly stories, but the way he described it gave me chills. I'm a 17 year old male, and I live in PA. My grandparents own 94 acres. Recently, my father and I were riding up in the woods, and we stopped to enjoy the scenery. I ended up making a joke about seeing a skinwalker, and my dad told me about this time when he and his cousin had a sleepover, and they heard coyotes yelping and howling up in the woods. They got on the quad and drove up to see what was going on. They ended up not seeing anything, but it was on their way back that they saw something. My grandparents have this really small, beat up old shed. When my father and cousin were driving back, they saw a massive horned beast hunched over the shed. They didn't say a word. They just kept driving. When they got back to their grandparents' house, they went to bed and said nothing. My father is not somebody who would be afraid of anything paranormal. Of course, they were only teenagers at the time. My dad is now 50, and my cousin passed away a few years ago. Since that day, my father will not go into the woods unarmed. So I used to work at a nursing home. 
And most people would think that nothing bad would ever happen there. But that is all false. As most of our patients are the elderly, there is plenty of deaths that occur at our facility. So I worked down in the dementia care ward. And there was a lovely resident that I cared for, for HIPAA purposes, I'll name the person Beth. She was unfortunately put on hospice a few weeks ago, and she met her untimely death three days ago. She was 92. As a residential care associate it was my job to clean out the room for a new resident. As I walked in her room, it felt too cold, and that is weird because all nursing homes are always hot, because the elderly get cold easily. I just felt a kind of cold that's only bone chilling. I tried to shrug it off as I took the sheets off of the bed. As I was bending over to take off the fitted sheet, I felt a push. It felt like cold hands pushed me with strength I've never felt before. It happened so quick that I was just confused and scared. I quickly grabbed all the sheets and booked it out the door. But when I turned my head around, I saw it. I saw a human-like figure shadow in the closet. It was a quick look so I couldn't really identify the person. But I can say for certain that it was Beth, playing a prank on me before she departed to the afterlife, as me and her would play pranks on another, while I took care of her. So yay that is my encounter with the paranormal. Hello everyone, I want to talk about some things from my past life, that impacted my current life. My mom and I are spiritual and she contacted the spirit of my best friend yesterday when I was having a mental breakdown, he is from my past life as a Vietnam soldier. I got to know him since I was a young child, and we were best friends I can vaguely remember that his name was Damien or something, I basically grew up with him and his family treated me as I was one of them. Very nice family at that time, but once the Vietnam War started, things took a turn. During our deployment, I was very paranoid of being ambushed by the Vietnamese, so I slept with a gun in my hands. Due to all the mental issues going on at that time, and the dark environment, I accidentally shot my best friend, because I heard someone walking towards me in an odd way. I was devastated and turned batshit insane after that. I was no longer suitable for duty so they sent me home. I was full of regret, shame and grief. People around me were treating me harshly because we veterans, failed to win the war. And the family members of my best friend, even placed a curse on me out of anger and resentment. The curse that I would never be happy and fulfilled again. This curse haunted me in the current life, where I am reincarnated into. I always ask myself why I feel like I'm not worth it, or why the things in my life happened the way they did. Now I feel like the pieces of the puzzle are fitting together. The purpose of my current life is to lift the curse, and become mentally strong again. I can finally have peace with myself now, which I didn't achieve with psychotherapy before. Moral of the story, unresolved mental issues and curses can haunt you in your next life, be sure to cope with them, and be open-minded or disciplined to meditation. This way you gain insight about previous lives, and you can prevent yourself from making the same mistakes this time. I don't know if I should report this, or what, I just need some guidance. I'll try to keep it brief. Saturday night my boyfriend and I were heading home after a drinkless night out. I was driving and pulled up to a red light and told him keep an eye out for the green light for me. Because I wanted to check my phone. Now I always pull up on the white line. I hate when people stop short of it. I was fully aware and not sleepy at all when I said this. For additional context, I was going down a slight hill. I was up the hill from the light. So I would have had to roll backwards up the hill with my car and drive. I also have the auto parking brakes when my car comes to a complete stop. The next thing I know, I woke up, car about 40 away from the line by the red light. Confused and a little panicked, I muttered something like, what the hell, and my boyfriend sat up and said, what the f just happened. I snapped at him. I said let me know when the light turns green. I don't know. He said, how long were we sitting here, I shrugged. He says, my video played for 10 minutes, 
and went back through the video and didn't remember any of the video in the time that had passed. It creeped me out, I barely slept Saturday night. And Sunday joked about it to my sister. But today, on the way to work my boyfriend and I passed the same traffic light, so I asked him, what do you think happened Saturday? Weird huh? And he had no idea what I was talking about. I recounted the entire story as specific as I could. He didn't even remember getting home or the ride home. So, do you think something supernatural happened? And if so, do I report it? To where? Scary experience with my brother. So, this was in 2017. My brother was sleeping alone in his own room. As he was tucked in his sheets, he saw that the sheets were literally rising over him, as if something wanted to suffocate him under the sheets with no air supply. He was resisting, but the harder he resisted, the faster the sheets grew over him. He then said he tried to scream but couldn't. Then he heard a loud clang. Lord Hanneman's statue in our home fell down, and he could move freely now. He ran straight to my parents and sobbed. My parents were exchanging uncomfortable looks. I saw because I came out too. Then I noticed there was something like a black figure watching over us from about 5 meters away, waiting to attack again but couldn't. I believed it to be his nightmare, but I really couldn't figure out until now how a 6 feet statue fell down on its own, when it had been standing straight for 5 years. This is something I experienced as a teenager. To put in context, this was the post 9-11 years. I had a close friend whose family were naturalized citizens from a, shall we say, suspect country. For younger readers, I can't adequately state the level of paranoia and suspicion and harassment that happened then. It's similar to German Americans being harassed during World War I and II, or Asians being attacked after sea pandemic. Black sites, torture, and the Patriot Act allowing unconstitutional spying and privacy. But I know what it's like to be bullied, so I stood up for my friend, and due to issues at home, often spent time with them, at theirs instead. Twice at seemingly random times during the day or weekend, and I was told that this further happened when I wasn't there as well. It just happened that I was around at the time, a weird dark colored vehicle with unusual plates, not state plates, with a smaller designation than as usual, would show up at the house. Couple of guys in suits would get out. They were a little. Weird. I've never seen the man in black movies, but they were very tall and lean, the suits were very alike, and they spoke very carefully and held themselves very. Strictly and upright. They would greet my friend and I, but seemed more interested in talking to her parents. The first time this happened, I was a little freaked out. So my friend and I got a bit of money and went out to run an errand out of the house. I did ask what these people wanted, but didn't get a great answer, just that it was complicated, and not to listen at doors or tell everyone what they were doing. The second time, I was less freaked out, at least at first, and told my friend that we should go. But instead, one of the weird suit guys asked to talk to me. I was worried, but everyone said it was okay. They weren't going to hurt anyone, just answer questions. This guy took me to another room, gave me a business card with a name and government department on it in English and Arabic. I kept it for a while, but lost it during a college move, and started asking me questions about the family. Had I ever noticed any extremism beliefs, anything odd or strange that they did or said? I emphatically denied this, said they were nice, normal people, no odd beliefs, money issues, weird travels, no issues assimilating, didn't go into a lot of detail. I had very little media exposure at the time because my parents were strict about TV. But I did watch Law and Order Weekly with my dad. So I figured he was a bit like a cop, and I shouldn't say too much. He was weird though, tall, lean but well built, and really pale with short hair. My grandfather was ex-military, so I could recognize a haircut as being within regulations. Does anyone have ideas as to what could have happened? Unsure if it's encounters with albeit strange actual intelligence personnel, or something else. 
Was it common at the time for people of certain backgrounds to be questioned or used for anti-terror work? My older brother died about two years ago. He was in a car crash that fatally took his life after a drunk driver flew head on into him. At first it was hard, but I progressively begin to heal and move forward. About four months ago, me and a couple friends went to Dave and Buster's. We ate and went to play games. I remember that me and one of my friends had gone to play Pac-Man. He wanted to reach the highest level possible. I eventually had to take a bathroom break, and I told my friend that I would be back. One of the older guys in the crowd who had been talking to us for a while agreed to take my spot until I came back. While I was going to the bathroom, I passed by one of the games. I believe it was a zombie game. I could see a woman and a man sitting inside. I should have passed by and kept walking like usual, but I stopped because I heard a voice that sounded familiar. I turned back around and did my best to peek inside without them noticing, just in case I was wrong. I immediately could see the buzz cut, the stud earrings, the silver watch, the scar on the elbow that only my brother had. I couldn't stop myself from calling out his name. A feeling took over me, and looking back now, I believe it may have been grief. I know the stories of people who see their dead loved ones, but this wasn't one of those. The woman kept playing the game as she obviously hadn't heard me, but the man sort of tilted his head and looked at me. He looked exactly like my brother. He stared at me without smiling or any emotion. I don't know why, but I left immediately. I went back to my friend and told him that we needed to go. When we met up with my other friends, they were all confused and kept asking me questions about what happened. I told them that I would tell them later, and I just wanted to leave. We had to wait for an Uber, so we were going to sit inside until then. My friend encouraged me to go to the bathroom again, and said he would wait outside the door. I agreed and went. While I was washing my hands another person came in, and began to wash their hands next to me. I looked up and immediately saw the face of my brother. I didn't know what to do, I just stood there. He kept washing his hands, and he made eye contact with me a couple times. Everything about him was the same. His features, the scar, the accessories that he wore. It felt like hours, but it was only a couple minutes. He turned the water off, dried his hands and left. My friends told me that yes, a man had left, but they weren't really paying attention, so they didn't see his face, but they remember the watch. I know about the stories of people that see things that aren't really there, and I know that doppelgangers exist, but why would he look at me when I said his name if it wasn't really him? And why would he come into that particular bathroom, out of all the bathrooms he could have went to? I have tried numerous times to tell my mom, but she refuses to listen. She said that she is thinking about putting me in therapy, because I obviously haven't healed. My friends sometimes laugh at me and tell me that maybe I saw a ghost or something, even though they also remembered the watch. I'm not sure what to believe but I'm positive that wasn't my brother. Story time. My roommate and I were driving to Estacada for pie and coffee. I saw a reflection of what appeared to be eyes alongside the road between the road and river. Then, as we came closer, driving, I saw what appeared to be a human-like head, shoulders, and forearms behind a tree above a horizontal tree limb. It startled me because I had never seen anything like that before. We drove for another mile or so, and neither of us said a word. Finally, I said, Kevin, did you see something back there? He said yes. I asked him what he saw and described to me what I just wrote. The next day, we went back to the site to see if maybe we could figure anything out. That limb was about seven feet above the ground. It was dry, and we didn't see any tracks. Across the highway, there was a swamp with a cliff behind it and timber and farms beyond that. There was a game trail diagonally from the highway to the river, which is about 75 feet away. That's all. Description of creature, it must have been around 10 feet tall, judging by the limb we saw it behind. Dark brown in color, short neck, wide body compared to me, 
6 feet 4 inches 240 pounds. Late one fall evening in 1978, around 2 a.m., our horses suddenly became very agitated and noisy. Figuring a bear may be prowling about, my son and I grabbed flashlights and our 30 to 30 and hurried off to investigate. By now, the horses were very upset and in danger of hurting themselves in an effort to get away from the bear. I was fearful that the bear may have entered the corral. When we arrived at the corral, whatever animal was present was crashing off into the brush, we could hear it. The horses were terrorized. To our amazement, a 7-inch diameter tree, which had served as one of the posts of our corral, had been snapped and bent over. It seemed odd that a bear would do this, but we had no reason to suspect otherwise. We shined the light off into the woods but were not about to go tracking off into the dense woods at that time of night. We did not want to enter the corral with the horses worked up the way they were. We decided that they were slowly calming down in our presence and we may as well go back to the tree to take a better look at how it was broken. That is when I came to know a fear that I didn't think possible. At and around the base of the tree were footprints which were obviously not bare. As we looked closer, the slow realization came upon us that these footprints were very large and very human-like. As the unthinkable became obvious, I felt a tingling wave sweep over my body and the feeling that I was not present in my own body, but merely an observer from a distance. I could not accept what I knew was true. The prints were deeply implanted into the soil at the end of slip marks that were about 8 to 10 inches long. At the end of the slip marks were the deepest imprints. Five very human-like toe prints. I believe this was caused by the animal's foot as it dug in to brace itself to break the tree. This is the first I have talked of this incident. Soon after it happened, I sold the property. I was never comfortable there after that night, always feeling. I was being watched. To this day, I still suffer nightmares where I hear panicked horses and awaken to the vivid sight of those footprints lit in the flash of a lightning bolt. I had always been an avid and capable woodsman and hunter. I know game and the ways of wildlife. This is something that I cannot explain. You can use this as you wish. I am now 67 years old, and I think it needs to get out. Only my son, who sits with me as I write this, and I know what really happened that night. We agreed to tell my wife and daughter it was a bear and wiped out the prince. We do wish to remain anonymous as we feel our credibility and prestige in the area would be damaged. We are one of the largest landowners in the county. Long drag marks of something very large were pulled through a small clearing and then through very dense clumps of Oregon grape, huckleberry, and what I would guess was manzanita. These shrubs and small trees had significant damage to them. I would have discounted this as the work of a bear, but for the fact that the damage reached a height in excess of 10 feet on the scattered trees along the drag path, and the drag marks continued for almost 200 yards before gradually diminishing, all while going up an incline. About two hours later, my cousin and I were on the southeast side of Baldface Creek and noticed a large, at least 7 to 8 feet tall, Animal covered with dark brown fur sitting on a stump, yes, sitting on a stump, watching us directly across from where we were hiking. The animal stood, made a gesture, and strode off into the surrounding forest. Curious, we decided to try to get a closer look. As we descended toward the bottom of the hill to the creek, we heard a large amount of noise and turned to see that not 100 yards more and we would have run into a bear and her cub feeding off the berry bushes along our previous path. To this day, I am unsure of the creature I saw and question whether or not it was motioning my cousin and me out of potential danger. Other witnesses, there were a total of five people that witnessed the drag marks and damage to vegetation by the old deserted mining camp, and two witnesses that observed the animal, Bigfoot, environment, This incident occurred at a confluence of two mid-sized creeks at the base of Biscuit Hill, which to my knowledge is around 3,275 feet tall. The main vegetation for this particular area is mostly a mixture of pine and fir, with thick areas of manzanita, I believe this is the shrub, huckleberry, and Oregon grape.
I was a part of a Navy SEAL team called SACOP Recon. If you know anyone who was a Navy SEAL they'll tell you they never heard of us which is by design. They'll think you mean Spec Ops. We're above that. Spec Ops guys don't even know we exist. The team operates within special access programs, all of which are programs and projects that have the highest security clearance the US government uses. I can't tell you any of the things I worked on and I wouldn't if I could. Let's just say that if the military or an intel group needed to see or do anything underwater that no one could know about and that also required knowledge of technologies and information that even regular SEALs aren't cleared to have access to, they'd send us in. Our job was to survey the site in detail. Not like you see on National Geographic, where they do some sonar scans and sit back and write a paper about it and pat themselves on the back. They take years, sometimes decades to do what we have to do in a few days. We map out every inch of the area with high quality sonar, infrared, visible light, x-ray, backscatter microwave, and a few things I can't mention. By the time we're done, if there's a dime sitting buried in the sand on the ocean floor you can find it in our data. Our work is quickly processed and handed over to our sister team called SAC Op Strike. Normal SEAL teams call these guys fire teams. They do everything from sabotage, disarming mines, to underwater combat. Yes combat. Actual underwater combat. They have special weapons designed to work underwater and I'm not talking about mere knives and spear guns. Anyway, it was 2013 and we were sent to the Baltic Sea with orders to check out something that had recently been found on the ocean floor by some sunken treasure hunters. It's called the Baltic Sea Anomaly. The Swedish government had quietly shut the treasure hunters' study of the object down and made them sign national security oaths to keep their mouths shut and play it off like they can't find funding for further expeditions. Meanwhile they called the US for assistance. They have their own divers of course, but this thing was shutting down any and all electronics that came within 200 feet of it. They were stumped. The object itself was located about 300 feet below the surface and was just sitting there on the ocean floor. It was almost perfectly round except for a few sections that looked as if they had been cut out. It had the basic shape of that ship Han Solo flew in the Star Wars movies, the Millennium Falcon. The treasure hunter's original sonar image had been published before the Swedes had the situation under control so the public was already theorizing it to be a UFO. It was not. The object sat at the end of a long trail in the sand that stretched out on the bottom and into a ravine that appeared to be cut out of a small undersea mountain. This gave the impression to some that this was a crash landing scar on the ocean floor where the object had slid to a stop upon its sinking. It was not. I was looking forward to the challenge of performing a reconnaissance mission without the aid of electronics. We brought a few devices with us just in case, but were fully prepared and expecting not to be able to use them. We even had underwater flares in case our lights shut off. Our mission was simple, determine the basic nature of the object and survey its exterior in detail. This sounds easier than it is. Especially without cameras and electronics. To determine the nature of the object we use the null hypothesis approach. This is where you try to rule things out by attempting to disprove your hypothesis. In this case we were acting on the hypothesis that the formation was natural in origin. Was it sandstone or a buildup of sediment that just happened to form a shape that coincidentally looked like a construction? Deep down I was thinking it was probably some World War II equipment that had been scuttled or blasted off of a ship during the war. Maybe the base of a large ship mounted gun. But why would it be knocking electronics out? And how? At any rate all of us were geologists, marine biologists, and oceanographers so we knew exactly what to look for. I know that might sound odd to you. You have to understand that knowing what we are doing in all situations that we might encounter is what the military was paying for. You are not deployed in our group without these skills. If you don't want to do the schooling stay in the regular SEALs. In addition to our skill set our team only had two squads of three men each and no commanding officers. All six of us were officers of equal rank. We designed the missions ourselves and operated with extreme self-discipline. If you need an officer to tell you what to do, then you aren't fit for our kind of work. 
The Navy learned the hard way a long time ago that a commanding officer's ego can ruin a mission in certain circumstances. And while it might be necessary to have one when the men under him need that to perform, in the case of SEC op missions they only get in the way and risk lives and mission failure, and we did not fail at our missions. It wasn't allowed. Teams in the old days had to keep shanking their commanding officers to ensure mission success and finally the Navy just started letting us do our thing. My squad was going to start by taking samples of the surface material that had settled or otherwise built up on the object. We would drill through it with diamond-tipped hand-powered drills we had to determine what the object beneath was composed of. We'd do this with the aid of special chemistry test kits we had which were designed to work in ocean water. Remember, we couldn't use spectrometers because electronics were useless. The other team was going to examine every inch of the thing looking for signs of manufacturing. Both teams would also create a map of the object's magnetic field and variance if there was any using only handheld compasses and underwater pencils. Yes, we were that good. We began our dive when the sun was exactly 45 degrees above the horizon. This would provide enough light so we wouldn't need to use our flares for most of the day. We didn't bring air tanks except small ones for emergencies, and instead had hoses coming from the surface, supported by airbags every 50 feet. This would allow us to stay down as long as we needed. The strike team was topside in the boat making sure the air pumps were working and preparing for whatever they might have to do once we came back with our assessment. They weren't expecting to have to do anything as we all assumed that this was either a piece of wartime hardware or an ancient ruin but they were prepared anyway. They always were. On the way down, I noticed there were no fish or life of any kind in the waters around us. Usually that time of year you could find flounder, herring, cod, and other species of fish swimming about. Maybe it was an odd coincidence but I found it noteworthy just the same. As we approached the object a strange feeling came over us. It was an unusual feeling for us all. It was mild fear and apprehension. We had all been in much more dangerous situations than this before and we were trained not to fear. We didn't fear death, injury, or even drowning, yet all of us reported the same sensation. We wore special dive masks that covered our entire faces so we could speak to each other. Sound travels well in the water and so as long as we were close enough we could all discuss what we needed to. We agreed to continue the mission in spite of this feeling but to make sure we kept each other aware of any increase in feelings of duress that we might experience. We soon arrived at the object and split up into our respective squads. Up close the object was clearly not a natural formation but we would go through our process anyway to be thorough. The object was somewhat flat on top except for a small perfectly smooth dome on the right side. To the left side there was a stairway going up to the flat top. The right angles and straight lines on the object had been dismissed as a rare but real natural phenomena that occurs due to the molecular nature of certain types of stone combined with water erosion from tides and currents. But here the stairs were sandwiched between flat stone walls on both sides which would prevent water from moving in the necessary directions to erode the stairs into the perfect steps that they were. I chipped off a small chunk of the material on the side of the structure and put it into my test kit's receptacle, squeezed some chemicals into the enclosure, and shook it. I already knew but the resulting color of the mixture verified that the object was indeed covered with a thick layer of silt and sand that had built up compacted, and hardened over time. It must have taken a long time to get into the state it was in because that part of the Baltic Sea didn't have a lot of turbulent water or natural silt. I got the drill out and turned the hand crank as the bit sunk into the caked on silt and sand. It went down about 4 inches when it hit the underlying structure. I withdrew the drill, blew the silt out of the hole with a turkey baster type of device we use, and looked in. I recognized the material right away. It was coarse-grained granite. Pink, black, and white specks together. The surface of the object wasn't just made from granite which shouldn't be found at the bottom of the sea, but it was polished granite. Perfectly flat and smooth. I cleared off some more of the compacted sand covering the area and showed it to my team, Brent, and David, both of whom were busy mapping the magnetic variants of the object. 
David swam over to the other squad to inform them of the discovery while Brent showed me the map they had made thus far. It was unbelievable. They drew on a plastic sheet that had a sketch of the object on it with a special kind of grease pencil that worked underwater. The lines they drew around it represented the distance from the object where the magnetic field the object emitted varied from standard north or south, and each line had a number on it indicating how many degrees off from the expected compass reading it was at that point. According to the map, the object was pulling the compass needle a full 45 degrees away from magnetic north towards itself. This effect was not present at the surface as we had checked before descending. Just then David swam back over and told us that the other squad had found something that we needed to see. We met them behind the object where the bottom of the structure met the ocean floor. The men had discovered a small doorway. My squad volunteered to go inside. We removed our air lines and hooked up our emergency air tanks, each containing about a half hour of air. It was dark inside the passageway and so I lit up a flare. We were in a hallway that led back towards the front of the object, but underneath it. The walls had less silt on them and we could wipe it off with our hands down to the polished granite. About halfway back the passageway ramped upward and we walked up and out of the water into a large room inside the structure. The room was dark and cold. My flare lit the walls and ceiling revealing the same polished granite as the outside. There were engravings in the stone wall every 4 feet or so. The ceiling was about 12 feet from the floor. The room was a half circle in shape and had three granite tables that resembled altars a little bit, one on each side of the ramp and one behind it. The rest of the room was bare. I tried to turn on my flashlight and as expected it did not work. David started sketching the images on the engravings which appeared to me to be depictions of human sacrifice. In the images, the rituals were taking place on the top exterior of the very structure we were inside. It was clear from the scenes depicted that this building wasn't always underwater. Either the oceans had risen since it was in use, or the land had sunken. Brent pulled me over to one of these engravings and pointed. There in the image was some creature devouring the sacrifice. The men in the scene weren't sacrificing people to some deity, they were feeding a monster. It was like a man in that it had two legs and feet, however at the waist it appeared to have about a dozen tentacles coming off its body but no arms. It did have a head though but it looked more like a giant mouth gaping open with a large teeth. The thing had large feathers coming off its back and the top of its head as well. I've never seen anything like it depicted before however there are some Aztec and pre-Columbian figures that are similar in a few ways. Brent and I quickly measured the room's dimensions and did a walkthrough, covering every square foot of the place. We found a stone door that appeared as though it was supposed to rotate on a central shaft, however we could not get it to budge. We discovered a stairwell that descended downward, but not back into the water. This went down into stone. We surmised that the structure had been built on top of an even larger rock or mountain that was now buried by the seafloor. We descended the stone stairwell, which was not made of the same granite as the upper chamber. Instead this material looked like standard seafloor basalt. The stairs ended about 40 feet down into a small antechamber. There were some relics on the floor there, a spear and a set of ankle shackles. Both appeared completely oxidized to the point where they would probably disintegrate upon our attempting to pick them up. The room had an opening that led into a huge cavern which was lit by an abundance of bioluminescent algae which coated much of the cave walls as well as a small river that flowed in and out of a set of pools. The water glowed a bright aqua color from this algae which made the water cloudy and opaque. There were large quartz crystals embedded in the rock along with iron pyrite and veins of gold. The view was spectacular. We wondered aloud what had been in those shackles. We suspected it was the creature from the engravings or perhaps a sacrificial victim. There were footpaths that ran between the rock and stalagmites that formed the floor of the cavern. We split up and each proceeded down different paths giving ourselves exactly 10 minutes time to meet back at the foot of the stairwell. Our air would be running out by then and we weren't going to risk trying to breathe the ancient air down there. We'd have to head back soon. We took air, water, and sand samples as well as photographs using old-fashioned, non-electronic cameras loaded with a special film designed for low light. 
The cavern seemed to go back at least 300 feet, with a ceiling around 30 feet high. The width I estimated in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 feet. I could hear water pouring into water coming from the rear of the cave and so I headed back to ascertain whether or not there was some kind of waterfall back there someplace. I rounded a bend in the footpath and saw the source of the sound. A two-foot diameter flow of water was pouring out of the sidewall of the cave about 20 feet up, arcing into a pool that was recessed in the floor. Behind the waterfall there were several skeletons chained up to the back wall. I started to take some photos of this when I felt something wrap around my right ankle. Looking down I beheld a black tentacle protruding up out of the pool which had wrapped around my lower leg several turns. I instinctively pulled my leg away but it tightened its grip as I did so. I sounded a distress call from a noise-making device we each carried on our wetsuit as I struck the tentacle with my fist in the hope it might release me. It pulled back a bit which caused me to fall onto my back. I reached for my rock pick as the thing rose up out of the water. It was hideous. It used its tentacles for support on the black rocky ground. Its head was like an octopus only the mouth was front facing. It growled, bearing what reminded me of shark teeth with several rows going towards the back of its throat. It started to pull me towards it and lift me up off the ground when Brent reached me with David not far behind. He struck the tentacle that held me with his rock pick letting loose a glowing aqua-colored fluid from the creature's flesh. It immediately dropped me and turned its attention to Brent. Its saucer-sized, amber eyes twitched back and forth as it examined him a moment before it lashed out with two of its tentacles. As it did, both of these appendages projected long, thin, sharp, white-ribbed rods from their tips which pierced Brent's torso. The creature then lifted him up and pulled him in towards its gaping and shrieking mouth. David had arrived at my location by then and began to drag my body backwards away from the thing as it put Brent's head into its mouth and closed it in a circular fashion around his neck where its teeth cut through Brent's wet suit and flesh. He flayed around trying to break free for a moment before the creature had bitten his head clean off. We could only watch and take a few photos from a distance as it used its tentacles to peel back his wet suit and munch on Brent's body like a human would when deshelling a shrimp. I got to my feet as David announced that we needed to let the strike team handle it. The two of us headed for the stairwell as fast as we could. Before we could get there, the creature swam along the river next to us and jumped out of the water, tackling David while thrusting its pointy rods through him just like it did to Brent. David and the beast fell over sideways and it proceeded to feed on him. It did so with such ferocity and speed that I had no time to try to save him. All I could do was run and take advantage of the fact that it would be stalled from killing me for a minute as it feasted on David. I glanced back as I ran and saw that the creature had put David's lifeless body down and had begun to pursue me. I guess it didn't want to lose any of that rare human meal it had discovered. I suppose it had been feeding on the algae in the water for so long that the taste of blood once again after all these years was too much for it to resist. Just as I was reaching the opening into the small chamber where the stairwell was, the thing flung itself at me and I landed on my back. I had my rock pick in hand by then so I started to bang its pointed tip into the meat of one of the monster's tentacles. It withdrew it but as it did, the thing wrapped its body around my upper torso and pressed its flesh against the back of my neck where I could feel tiny bristle-like hairs stick into my spine. Like little needles they inserted deep into my nervous system where the creature hijacked my motor control. It used this method to couple with my brain and our minds became one mind. I knew its entire history, thoughts, and experiences. I understood its deepest motivations and desires and it knew mine. It used my legs to walk as it rode me like a horse back up the stairwell, into the chamber above, and down the ramp to the open sea outside. It hadn't been out of the cavern in over a millennia as it needed a human host to climb the stairs. I could feel its excitement as we exited the structure and proceeded to kill the three men in the other squad who had been waiting for our return. Knowing the lethality of the strike team it opted to steal an inflatable motorized raft and sink the boat by having me chip a hole in the hull with my rock pick. The sound of my doing this alerted the seals inside to our presence and two of them entered the water to check it out as we sped off in the raft. 
I got an oversized trench coat to hide the creature on my back so I could move about among the masses without causing a stir. I haven't checked in with the Navy in several weeks now and am currently sitting in a cheap hotel room in Barcelona typing this. While I would like to be rid of this thing, I also have to admit that I feel its pleasure at the taste of human blood and meat. Our minds have become one and I am as much it as I am me. I know the military will have sent a wet team to track me down by now and I know they will probably eventually find me. I have to stay on the move. The trail of dead will soon give away my whereabouts as the method of the kills is unique and leaves its own signature. I'm putting this story online as a last ditch effort to get a message through to my dear mother, Jane, the only person I still feel connected to and whom I miss dearly. I love you mom. I'm sorry about all of this and maybe someday if I'm lucky we can meet again. I've already left too many bodies here, so I'm leaving Barcelona tonight before daybreak. But first I feed again. I like to spend some alone time occasionally. Last fall, in October 2023, I spent a day in the Allegheny National Forest in northwest Pennsylvania. I like the forest because of the tall trees and nature, I'm able to relax and think to myself without interference. I got there early in the morning just as dawn was breaking. I got out of my truck and hiked to the Rimrock Overlook. There was a foggy blanket draping the Allegheny Reservoir. I had my binoculars and my camera and wanted to go deeper into the woods. The daylight was just peeking through the forest and the wildlife was beginning to wake and become active. As I was watching the birds with my binoculars, out of nowhere this weird sound came. It was like a mix of a deep growl and a long moaning that just echoed through the forest. It was so surprising and different from the usual forest noises that it actually gave me a creepy feeling. My heart was racing while I stood there not moving, still holding the binoculars to my eyes looking around anxiously trying to figure out where that sound was coming from. Then I saw it. It looked like someone or something moving past the dense underbrush. It was huge and somewhat hidden in the fog. As soon as I noticed it though it vanished. I was freaked out. I thought that maybe it was a bear or an elk. But that unfamiliar noise had me thinking that it was something out of the ordinary. After a few minutes of whatever it was vanishing, the forest went back to normal. I was left standing there equal parts scared and curious. Then it showed itself again, but further to my right, I guess it was about 50 yards away from me. Whatever it was it appeared as tall as a young tree, around 8 feet tall with shoulders over 4 feet wide. It moved in a way that was smooth but also very strange. I didn't want to blink and miss it. The creature quickly moved around bushes and jumped over logs surprisingly quiet for its size. The fur looked rough and its colors shifted between light brown and red when the sunlight hit it. I could see it had a wide back, big muscular arms, and a flat face. The odor that I was then smelling is what really scared me. It was faint, like a rotten smell that seemed to stick in my nose. It made me nervous and my heart started pounding. I wanted to run back to my truck but I was just too curious. Then suddenly the thing turned its head towards me and I just froze. I briefly saw its huge forehead and distinct brow. But then it was gone. It simply vanished into the thick forest just as quietly as it had first appeared. I saw something weird that I can't explain. Was it a Sasquatch? I finally decided to walk back to my truck. My mind was going crazy. Every little sound sent an alert and I didn't feel safe anymore. That night at home I experienced a series of bizarre dreams. It was as if the creature was communicating with me. I know that sounds crazy, but that is what happened. In fact, it took several weeks until the dream stopped. I had this overwhelming feeling that I was supposed to return to find answers. I have resisted returning to the area because of my fear of encountering the creature or, maybe, something more terrifying. I have so many encounters with the weird and strange I don't even know where to start but I think you will like this story. This crazy scary dog stopped me from drinking one night. This happened in Port Orchard, Washington around 2009. I was in a program called Drug Court which required me to take random UAs, stay sober, 
and pretty much get my life back together because I had got caught up with a marijuana charge in 2008. So instead of doing the two years in prison they wanted to give me I had the opportunity to do a program of recovery called drug court. I jumped at the opportunity. I was sober for about 9 or 10 months and was in a relationship with the lady that I am still friends with today. I tend to have a sixth sense about things and I had a bad feeling she was cheating on me. And I was looking for an excuse to go drink. I made my mind up and started to leave the house which was up a steep hill towards a dark road next to a park and I would have to continue on past the park and down another steep hill. Once I got to the top of my hill to walk towards the park I was stopped suddenly in my tracks because about 50 or 60 yards away from me was a dark black muscular vicious looking pit bull or rottweiler. I'm not completely sure and I did not want to find out. It was just sitting in the middle of the road blocking my path to the bar. So I said nope and turned around and walked back down my hill through my backyard over a fence through my neighbor's yard to get to a gravel road that led to about the middle of the other hill I had to walk down to get to the bar. Now this was quite a long way away from where I originally planned to walk because I don't feel like going out of my way and walking through neighbor's yards. So I'm walking down the gravel road and all of a sudden I see the same dog just walk up to the end of the gravel road which was probably 30 or 40 yards away from me and just sit in the middle of the gravel road growling at me. I was scared to death that this dog was going to attack me. But it just sat there and I could hear it growling from that far away. I'm 100% positive it was the same dog. But how did this dog even know where I was headed? How did that dog even know to stop me the first time? I was completely blown away and confused. I just wanted to get drunk and forget about my girlfriend for the time being. So to keep a long story short I turned around walked back through my neighbor's yards over the fence and back to my house and called my sponsor. I did not drink that night. And I stayed sober for another year and a half after that. Not sure if that was my guardian angel or what. I've told the story before in AA meetings and I'll end with this. Whenever I want to screw my life up it seems like God sends evil demon dogs after me. No joke. I've never seen the dog since and I really hope I don't again. I'm a retired federal law enforcement officer. I also did 18 years in the US Army as an MP before cancer forced me out. I still work for the DOD. I would like to share two short stories. I was one of those unlucky ones who while serving in Kansas had the misfortune of seeing one of these creatures decide to enter the perimeter of our military base. It made sounds that I can't even describe, guttural growling and bone rattling roars and screams as it went over a 15 foot fence. We had more than one occurrence of this type of behavior at this base. We're always ordered to ignore it and never document anything about it, except for a verbal report to the chain of command, but nothing more. When I was stationed there we had a private fresh from basic that was on duty and witnessed a display at the perimeter fence. The private freaked out and abandoned his post. The next morning he was sent for medical evaluation. I think the kid had a mental breakdown over what he witnessed. He never returned to our unit. If Uncle Sam didn't want anyone saying anything, that was the normal routine. I was 24 when this happened in 1994. What I saw was an 8 to 9 foot tall black with some gray around its face and on its chest. It would make these terrible noises and look straight into the CCTV cameras, then charge the fence. If nothing happened after two or three times it would charge and go right over the fence without any effort at all. If a mobile unit appeared when it was screaming and roaring it would throw rocks or smaller trees at the fence or sometimes go over the fence towards the vehicle. The only time I ever saw it leave without making a big show was once a helicopter buzzed the area with a spotlight and a thing hightailed it back into the trees and didn't return. A big bright light from the sky makes them feel the way they make us feel. The second story was in 2018 in Kansas, south of I-70 about 30 miles from Lake Milford. I was working late and had about a 40-minute drive home on rural county roads, some paved and some gravel. The area has rolling limestone cliffs and lots of dense trees, pastures, and hay fields. It was about 10.30 pm. On a winter evening, cold but no snow on the ground. 
I came around a curve on this two-lane county road that had only a few feet on each side before the trees started. No ditches to mention. I saw what I thought was a tree extremely close to the left side of the road. I had time enough for the thought to enter my mind that's a big tall stump, no branches. Then the eyes became visible and I thought I was going to have heart failure. The intensity of fear and sheer terror that gripped me I never felt before, even in combat. As I looked at those eyes I drifted over towards it unintentionally and as I passed, if it had reached out it could have touched my side mirror. I immediately swerved back to my lane and looked into both my side mirror and rearview mirror but couldn't see it. I have nightmares of that drive home regularly now. I understand now what witnesses describe after an encounter like that. I'm a veteran with six deployments between Iraq and Afghanistan and I was in some major engagements over there and I can tell you nothing in my life has ever affected me like that drive home. To this day I will not drive that road after dark and I've had that creepy feeling of being watched at my farm numerous times since that night. I have two cattle dogs and I won't go outside without them close to me. I always carry a gun on me and have a rifle or shotgun in my truck. Honestly, L don't think it would matter if this being decided to have it a human. It's game over. I remember experiencing a medical procedure as a child that I did not have in this reality. I recall, vividly, the dark red tinged room around me and laying on a metal table. While on the slab, I was being prodded and touched all over by seemingly giant praying mantis beings. I remember being horrified that they had bent arms, large black eyes, and insect bodies. I remember replicating their posture which was peering over with their arms by the side of the body and hooked wrists, T-Rex arms. I remember waking up while it was still dark, that same night, and my clothes were inside out. I even remember that I awoke feeling desperately thirsty and found my blue water bottle was no longer on the bed as it had been thrown under the bed frame. I remember feeling like I was being watched and the room felt weird. I felt confused because I had gone to sleep holding the bottle and had been lying under the blanket. Even to my young self, it was a shock to be tangled in blankets half flung off the bed. I've always been a deep sleeper and I usually wake up in the exact position that I've fallen asleep in. People have commented on how still I am while I sleep my entire life, and I've explained it's probably because I'm deaf which means sound doesn't wake me and I don't remain in a lighter stage of sleep. This also means it is hard for me to wake up as I'm so deep asleep so it's notable when I suddenly jerk awake. After waking on the other side of the bed with a completely disheveled bedspread, I was petrified of needles and blood tests. I suddenly developed a phobia and had to be held down to be given injections or needles. I recall my mum stating, you used to be fine with needles and watch them do it. Why are you acting like this? Stop thrashing and trying to run away. What happened to you? I told my mother about them and called them disgusting cockroaches. This was before I grew into adulthood and saw a photo for the first time depicting mantis beings, she said it must have been a dream. The needle phobia became a huge proponent to my medical fears which grew bigger and bigger. I became scared of the dentist, refused medical examinations or tests, and resisted medical visits. I started having dreams about medical teams coming into our home wearing white lab coats, and feeling terrified when I saw them taking my family members to run tests. The dreams were nightmares that continued for a few years after this incident. I remember the beings as detached and determined to meet their experiments or tests. These seemed human, but they were cold and detached. After some time, I recalled a memory of being in a medical setting with a huge light above my head and multiple faces holding instruments near my head and face. I asked my mum about it for years, even in my teens and early twenties, and she maintained that it never happened. As I've grown older, I've always remembered an even earlier encounter. I'm still wearing a nappy and I'm on a table slab with the prey mantis beings around me. I don't remember waking up afterward or being fully conscious of what happened before or after hence starting with the early encounter remembered with more detail. However, it wasn't an isolated memory with the mantis beings. I did a meditation a few years ago to try and calm myself down before an experience with a needle. I was unwell for a while and needed weekly cannulations. 
I hadn't received a needle since I was 8 years old because the phobia became so severe. I refused blood tests and would have obscene reactions in the dentist when they would insert needles until they started giving me gas to calm down. So, during the meditation, I saw the mortifying ordeal of being on a slab with mantis beings around me and tools being pushed into my body. I could see instruments going into my belly button, the top of my head, and down my throat. I was nearly going to stop the meditation but then, in an instant, the procedure was over. The next part of the memory resurfaced. Suddenly, the mantis beings didn't seem so terrifying. I was taken into a standing tank or cubicle that scanned me. It looked like a liquid but it didn't feel solid, squishy, or wet. They showed me where my DNA needed to be fixed as there was something wrong with my genes. The chamber was a full body scanning instrument that could completely penetrate and view your entire DNA code and body. I was able to see an implant in my brain. It has been some time, but I remember something about an implantation in my brain which was to help reprogram and update my DNA. After this meditation, my needle phobia went away as I dealt with medical teams. Something to note was that I did that meditation which revealed faulty genetics before receiving a diagnosis for faulty genetics. I thought that was interesting. I've had countless UFO sky sightings and strange encounters but this was the most real experience that was rich and vivid in detail, as if it was the same as recalling a birthday party as a child. I've been in contact with terrestrial aliens since I was a child. It was weird lights and apparitions when I was younger. Around the age of 18, it started turning into physical abductions at night and randomly seeing crafts periodically. This carried on all throughout my life until the age of 32. At that time it turned into something completely different. A week before I turned 32 my body started transforming. I have holographic orbs and serpents swirling around me now. It's an energy that I do not completely understand. It's part of me and incomparable to anything I've ever seen. It changes color and can move through solid objects, it reacts intelligently. This energy is inside and outside of me at the same time and it never leaves me or stops existing. The energy regenerates my body and mind. It heals me and can heal others. At one point during the transformation, there was an etheric injection in my arm and I felt a spark jump into my body. It shocked me. Now my eyes glow differently and I feel like I have more energy and soul than I did before. There's also a lot of energy to work with my chakras while lying in bed at night. This transformation has been going on for almost 10 months now. It will be a year around the end of December 2016. The race of aliens that I'm in contact with is the reptilians. The reptilians sent me holographs to communicate, they showed me our history through holographs. We evolved from earth reptiles and then there was some kind of war that's still being fought. From what I've gathered, I'm a reptilian or human hybrid. There's a hybridization program right here on earth with RH negative blood types and other hybrids do exist. Unfortunately, most have been killed, or haven't evolved enough mentally, physically, and spiritually, or want nothing to do with the reptilians out of fear or being brainwashed by organized religion. As of right now, there are only a handful of awakened or empowered hybrids. So there it is. I'm in direct contact with reptilians. They exist and we've formed a bond, they're really good to me. They guide, protect, and upgrade me. I wouldn't be alive without them. They've even saved my life multiple times. I trust them more than I do most humans. When the reptilians manifest on Earth, sometimes the females will come down to play. They look like the Celtic or Nordic race. I can always tell when it's one of them because the women are always perfect, with a glow to them and stars in their eyes. It will only be for some time, a few days or months, and then after that, they just disappear, never to be seen again. So basically from what I've gathered we have a race of reptilian or Nordic terrestrial genetic and technological alien masterminds right here with us on Earth. I stand by this firmly. I've spent almost 33 years of my life spinning in their web. I've never been the type of girl who gets scared easily and what's more, 
I never believed in paranormal stuff and creatures, like vampires, werewolves, etc., until I witnessed it with my own eyes. So, in 2012, me and my family went on a trip to Romania. We basically explored the country because my parents were really interested in its culture. After we visited Bistritza we decided to stop and have a picnic outside the town, even then my gut feeling gave me a warning that something was gonna happen. We stopped near a town called Slatnita. It all happened right next to a forest, there were special benches and a table in the middle of them, and a really small place where you could park your car. So we were just eating and chatting with each other when two people appeared literally out of the blue, I guess that they came from the forest. They stood right behind our parents' backs and they were just staring at us for like a minute. A guy and a girl. The guy looked like he was in his late 20s and the girl looked about 17 to 19 years old. They wore totally black clothes. The girl wore a black long dress, by the way I've just realized that it looked kind of like the dress that Morticia from the Adams family had, a corset, and very long black hair, literally so long, down to her thighs. He wore something like black pants and a black cloak with weird embroidery. He was tall and had long black hair just like the girl. But I mean you may think now, maybe they were just some goth teens who took a walk in the forest, but there are extremely weird things about them. They both were very pale and I don't think they had any makeup, because when they came up to us I could see veins on their necks and hands. The girl had very long and sharp nails without any nail polish. Their teeth. They never showed them, so I could only slightly see sharp teeth on their upper jaw when they spoke. I didn't like them since the moment I took a first glance at them. I can't explain it, there was just something so scary and intimidating about the way they looked at us. When they started approaching us I felt frightened. When I talked to my sister about it she told me that she felt the same. When they came up to us they asked if we were tourists. My parents said yes and they the girl just said, oh be careful here. Then they turned around and went in the direction where they came from. I was watching them this whole time, but my mom suddenly distracted me, and when I wanted to see them walking away they just disappeared. Literally like they never even were here. Now I'm 26 and I still have no freaking idea who they were and where did they come from. But when I recall those memories and see them in my head it's still so frightening. I have been travel nursing in remote northern communities in British Columbia since 2020. In the summer of 2021, I took an assignment in Fort Nelson, British Columbia. I decided to borrow the staff vehicle from the hospital I was working at and use my one day off to travel up to the Liar River. It takes about 5 hours to get there from Fort Nelson. I took in the scenery on the drive up the sheer remote and rugged nature of the land was palpable. I was on my way back home and close to the 529 km mark on the Alaska Highway when all of a sudden a feeling came over me for reasons unknown. I began to slow the car down. I was going quite slow when I saw something on all fours on the right hand side of the road. It was about 100 feet away at this point it was moving towards the road, coming out of the bush very quickly on the tips of its fingers and toes. Then it stopped at the edge of the highway. At this time I had come to a full diagonal stop in the oncoming lane. The creature was now about 20 feet away. It got up on two legs and appeared to be somewhere around 9 maybe 10 feet tall. It was covered in matted grey or brown hair that looked like dreadlocks. It had a solid muscular build and it walked in a very strange manner that is hard to describe if you haven't seen it. It crossed the paved part of the highway in four strides. It did not look directly at me but was very aware of my presence and I felt it inside my mind when it walked in front of the car. I was completely frozen. I could have moved if I wanted to and here's the wildest part. All parts of this creature were partially transparent. These parts would fade from visible to transparent over its entire body as it crossed the road. The transparent parts of the creature appeared blurry or almost made of water if that makes sense. It was the strangest thing I've ever seen in my life. I watched it dash under the trees on the other side of the road and after a while, I collected myself and drove the remaining 75 kilometers back to Fort Nelson. My roommate was selling our old fridge. 
He didn't let me know that someone was coming to get it one day. And I pull up to see someone loading up the fridge in our carport with no one home. I'm naturally defensive, cause what would you do if some strange guy was randomly in your carport loading up a fridge? Anyways I open with excuse me. What do you think you're doing? Long and short of it is that the dude hadn't paid for it yet nor confirmed with my roommate or owner that he was coming. We still sold him the fridge at the end of the day. I'm a 22 year old female for context. While I was living at uni by myself I messaged a man who had a PS2 for sale on Facebook, it was a really good price and looked really good condition. I really should have known it was too good to be true. Anyway, I message him about it and he says he will drop it off straight after work, and that he is working on a building site near where I live. All good right? Except he kept saying he will do me a solid and drop it right to my door, even though I repeatedly said I would meet him at a nearby car park. He said okay fine. He wasn't happy about it but whatever, I was getting my PS2 and I was buzzing about it. So a few hours go by and I walk up the hill to chill with my friend Adam who's a bloke and the same age as me. I flippantly mention that I'm meeting this man for the PS2 and Adam is all like? You can't just meet a random in a car park. I'm also very petite do I guess if someone wanted to grab me they could, which was Adam's thinking. I agree to let Adam come with me and actually it was a good idea. The man texts me again asking if we're still good to meet and what will I be wearing. I thought to recognize me. So I tell him what I'll be wearing and what I look like, and then I mention I'll be with a stocky, dark haired man with a beard. He stops replying, and deletes his Facebook account. I never hear from him again. I can't help but think something dodgy was going to happen and my friend making me tell the guy I wouldn't be alone prevented it from happening. Apologizing now since I am a horrible writer but, there is a small town called Gilgo Beach in Long Island, New York. It's pretty secluded and runs along a the back of a highway. For those of you who don't know, a few years back there were many dismembered bodies found along the highway in burlap bags. It seemed that the murderer was targeting prostitutes and finding them via Craigslist and other websites. They never found the killer but it is believed to have been linked to a series of similar murders in Atlantic City. Anyway, one night in the middle of winter at about 2 am my friend and I decide to go to the Fire Island Lighthouse which is about 5 minutes from Gilgo Beach and along the same highway. There are deer usually hanging around there at night and we wanted to feel them lol. Anyway, to get to this lighthouse you have to drive over a long narrow bridge and once you get over that bridge there is a roundabout around a big needle like water tower and the rest is beach. I will attach link a picture, there are no houses or stores. It's dark and there is no one there at night. So we get off the bridge and onto the roundabout when I pull up behind an older looking dark colored car on the farthest side of this roundabout. Mind you there are never any cars here this late in this season. A woman in a long coat gets out of this car walks in front of it towards the middle of the roundabout which is just the bottom of the water tower. The car speeds off fast and leaves the women. She is sitting there now all along in this secluded area in the middle of the winter late at night. My cousin and I circled a few times and she just stood there at the bottom of the water tower. She was there at least 30 minutes since we circled waited then circled a few more times. This woman would have had to walk at least 30 to 35 minutes to get to the first residence. And at least an hour to get to a store or a public place. We ended up calling the cops and never found out what happened. We still think if we didn't show up this woman could have been seriously hurt but since we pulled up maybe the guy got spooked and let her out. But why wouldn't she scream for help? But to the person in the dark car and the creepy women who stood at the bottom of the tower, Let's not meet. Unless you are a victim. Not super bad but long story short, I sold a car to a lady and her kids came with her. They were in their 20s. A few months later, I get a text from the daughter saying the woman passed away and they never took it to get tags and needed a copy of the title and would pay for me to get it since by law I had to be the one to get it. I met them and they gave me money. I got the title and sign it over again technically. 
Then a few weeks later the son texts me thanking me and shit and then suddenly asks if my wife and I want to have a threesome. I nicely tell him to f off and he calls me leaving me 5 voicemail of him crying and apologizing saying he's drunk and misses his mom. I had a Blackberry in 2014. I actually liked it quite a lot, but the apps were no longer being supported and every time I went outside, the sun would move my cursor around because of the heat. So, my cell phone situation was suboptimal. And I was a grad student who needed to check email and do things on the go, like text people coherent sentences without my cursor flying everywhere. I found a deal for a $300 iPhone 5, top notch at the time, on Craigslist, and contacted the seller. We agreed to meet at a local grocery store, and he said his mom had appendicitis so he couldn't stay very long. I was very grateful that he was taking the time to meet me while his mom was in the hospital. So I baked cookies for the family and met up with what ended up being a 16-year-old kid at a grocery store in Illinois. He gave the phone, which was dead because he said his mom ran over his charger with a vacuum cleaner. I paid him and gave him the cookies, took the phone home, and it worked but wasn't unlocked as advertised so it was unusable for me. Turns out it was stolen. I cried in my car for an hour. It still upsets me to this day because I try to have a lot of faith in humanity. I made his mom cookies. She probably wasn't even sick. First day on a new job a couple of years ago. During orientation, my phone starts ringing. Not a number I recognize, so I ignore it. It's already on vibrate. Then it rings again. And again. By the time I'm out of orientation, I have dozens of voicemails, but more meet and greets with coworkers, etc. When I finally get to check my voicemail after lunch, the voicemail is full. Scores of men leaving messages for Miss Becky, some leaving multiple messages getting increasingly desperate. I've had the phone number for years, so something must be up. I try to Google my phone number. But the calls are coming in so fast I'm constantly interrupted and I'm trying not to look like a bad employee on my first day. When I finally get a search completed, it pulls up a Craigslist ad with a man posing for pictures that no straight man should ever see with my phone number. The call slowed down by the end of the day and within a few days stopped completely and I never heard from Miss Becky again. Mine is a good story, last year I wanted a PS4 so did research and found one with GTA 5, Knack and Battlefield Hardline for $300 on Craigslist and next thing is he knocks on the door of my house 2 hours later and I have the check for $300, behind my micro so no shady crap, he comes in and explains that he wiped it it has controller HDMI and everything, stayed to help set it up and said he liked my house and he hopes to have a house similar to my parents, I'm 16 then, parents help transactions, and explain that he is getting a new job next week and needed the money for his family so I gave him an extra $50 for his situation, good deal. The night was dark and stormy, the kind of night that sends shivers down your spine even before anything unsettling happens. I had just finished chatting with my friend, Jake, over the phone. He sounded distraught, and his words echoed in my mind as I made my way home through the deserted streets. He had been searching for a good deal on a MacBook online, scouring various websites to find the perfect match for his budget. Eventually, he stumbled upon a seemingly too good to be true offer, a brand new MacBook at a fraction of the retail price. The catch? The transaction had to happen in person, in an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town. Against my advice, Jake decided to go for it. Greed clouded his judgment, and he found himself in a dimly lit, desolate place, surrounded by shadows that seemed to whisper tales of regret. The air was thick with tension as he handed over the cash to the mysterious seller. But things took a horrifying turn. Suddenly, out of the darkness, emerged a group of masked figures. They moved like ghosts, swift and silent. Before Jake could comprehend the danger, he felt a searing pain in his right hand. A gunshot echoed through the warehouse, and he crumpled to the ground, 
clutching his mutilated hand. The assailants vanished into the night, leaving Jake bleeding and broken. He managed to crawl out of the warehouse and call for help. By the time I reached the hospital, his once intact hand was reduced to a gruesome sight, only three fingers remained, a cruel reminder of the price he paid for his online bargain. As I sat by Jake's bedside, the weight of the story settled in the room like a thick fog. The incident haunted him, not just physically but mentally. The trauma of that night played out in his restless eyes, and the shadows seemed to dance menacingly on the hospital walls. In the following days, strange occurrences unfolded around Jake. He would wake up to the sound of distant whispers, his dreams plagued by masked figures reaching out for him. Paranoid and sleep-deprived, he became convinced that the ghosts of that forsaken warehouse were haunting him, seeking retribution for disturbing their malevolent domain. I tried to dismiss his fears as mere post-traumatic stress, but as the days passed, even I couldn't ignore the eerie atmosphere that clung to him. Objects would inexplicably move in his presence, and the air grew icy cold whenever he spoke of that fateful night. It was as if the spirits of the warehouse had latched onto him, determined to make him pay for the intrusion. One night, as I sat with Jake in his dimly lit apartment, the room plunged into darkness. The air became heavy, and a cold wind whispered through the cracks in the window. Suddenly, the flickering light of a single candle illuminated the room, casting eerie shadows on the walls. And there, in the corner, the masked figures materialized. They were ethereal, their forms shifting between reality and nightmare. Their eyes, empty voids, locked onto Jake, who trembled in terror. The room echoed with their ghostly whispers, recounting the details of that ill-fated transaction. I tried to grab Jake and escape, but an invisible force held me back. The figures approached him slowly, their spectral hands outstretched. And then, with a bone-chilling wail, they vanished, leaving behind a chilling silence. The room returned to its normal state, but Jake was changed. His eyes, once filled with life, now reflected the horror of the supernatural encounter. He spoke of a curse, a consequence for seeking a forbidden bargain in that forsaken warehouse. From that day forward, Jake lived in perpetual fear, haunted by the shadows of that macabre night. The warehouse became a place of dread, a portal to a realm where the price of greed was paid in blood and torment. And as for me, I couldn't shake the feeling that those masked figures lingered in the shadows, watching, waiting for the next unsuspecting soul to venture into their unholy domain. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.